Good afternoon. At this time, will all sergeants please start the recordings? Thank you. Recording to the cloud, all set. Thank Backup you. is rolling. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Parks and Recreation. At this time, will all members please turn on their video for verification purposes? Once again, Please turn on your video for verification purposes. To minimize any disruptions, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair Ku. We are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to acknowledge our fellow council members who are present. Council Member Diaz, Bavali, Holden, and Whitey. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Peter Ku, Chair of the City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to welcome you to our virtual hearing that will examine the athletic permitting process at parks. When you think about the benefits of parks, you might think about how the various recreational they offer to all our residents, from playgrounds for our children to recreation centers to athletic fields and courts as well as the beaches and pools. Today's hearing will deal with the athletic features of our past system and focus on the past department's process for issuing permits for use of its over 800 athletic fields, 1,800 basketball courts, and 550 tennis courts throughout the city. A few years ago, DPR, which stands for Department of Parks and Recreation, DPR, revamped the process to more fairly allocate ball fields and courts for a wide range of applicants by creating a process that will prioritize different categories of permit applicants with youth and school leads having first assets followed by adult athletic organizations, and then by non-affiliated individuals who apply to use a field for specified season. He also implemented a web-based system to help make the application process more efficient. Since then, concerns about the whole process have continued to be raised. And on top of that, the, con the COVID pandemic has resulted in much uncertainty among athletic field users and usual park goers regarding how and when permitted sports activity will be restored. Prior to COVID, numerous concerns were raised regarding allegations the various organizations and individuals who were issued permits sometimes hoarded them without actually using the field for which they were issued the permit. This resulted in park users being confused regarding what areas of a park were available for use. Also, some allege that various permit holders have sold or scout their permits to those who wish to use the field at a given time, thereby trying to profit for themselves. Further, until 2020, athletic activity for an even greater variety of sports was on the rise throughout the entire past system as usership increased. This gave rise to an increasing number of uh, complaints regarding the unauthorized use of particular 
other four fields, which added to the confusion and uncertainty already felt by many. COVID obviously did nothing to help this, situ uh, this situation, but past being forced to stop all permitted activity as in late March 2020. We stopped sports ball and stopping it once again as the numbers passed the 3% threshold. Recently, past announced you will start processing permits for the spring and summer. Permits will be issued to youth leagues and adults for baseball, softball, racket games, field hockey, soccer, long contact lacrosse, flat football, track and frisbee. According to DPR, all permit applicants must complete a COVID-19 safety plan and affirmation before the final review of a permit. And if safety plan violations are observed three times for a team, DPR will revoke permits for the entire league or organization. I'm hopeful that this hearing will examine whether the current practice that DPR has implemented have in fact led to a better and more equitable permitting process and whether the abuses that have been alleged for years are being properly addressed by DPR. I also hope you will resolve in gaming, in gaming a bit more certainty as to what DPR's specific plans are in the near future to allow safe permitted sports activities in light of the difficulties that the COVID pandemic presents. I will also like to call attention to a bill that we will be considering as well today. Intro 1959, sponsored by my colleague, Council Member Rodriguez, would establish an Office of Sports Recreation. The office will consult with the city's official marketing and tourism organizations to promote the city as a base for, pro for professional sports teams, making recommendations for the growth of professional amateur and scholastic sports recreation and coordinate sports initiatives with other city agencies. I look forward to exploring it in greater detail today and hearing what the administration and advocates think about this, legisla uh, this legislation. Thank you and welcome. At this time, I would like to invite Council Member Rodriguez to offer a statement on the bill he has sponsored. Okay, we are also joined by Council Member Borelli, Rodriguez, Moyer, Rivera, and Bannon. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for the great job that you're doing. I believe that both topics that you are addressing today are very important. The first one related to the permits, and the second one, again, the bill that I had the honor to be speaking about it today that has the support of public advocate Giovanni Williams also, as also has the support of Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, and many other great stakeholders that you will hear today. Uh, I, when, when we will open the section for the public, you will hear members from the Road Runner, from Astro Green, from the Armory, in Brooklyn, in Washington Heights, for local institution in our community, all of them supporting. And of course, the first person, uh, one of the uh, participants in Olympic competition, Presco, who also has been a great leader in this effort. Kempat Siva, also another person who was the last uh, 
a, a person in charge of a sport commission under, under Michael Bloomberg. And he had an idea on how we had this opportunity to take our mayor's office of a sport and recreation back uh, to our city. What is the goal? The goal is to centralize everything that we're doing as a city when it comes to a sports. Is there some level of a sport going on? The answer is yes. Which agency plays some role? DOE, Park Department, DYCD. If we ask New York City today, do we have the numbers? Can we look at how are we doing as a city, creating a pipeline so that youth have the opportunity to get the support that they need uh, to be competitive? in any small discipline that they choose, soccer, rowing, baseball, basketball, swimming, and others, the answer is we don't. And that's what we would like to see happen. So today's bill would like to restructure and bring back the creation of the mayor's office of a sport and entertainment that will be responsible to put a strategy and initiative together to support our youth to competitive sport. We thank everyone that provide a, a opportunity to our children and our youth in different sport a discipline. However, we can do better. Here in New York City, we have Fordham University. Division one in baseball. They are like 35 players. You know how many of them are black and Latino? Like three here in our city. Why? Because we don't have a pipeline to support, to identify, support the youth so that they get connected with all the training, with the coaches that they need to develop all the talent that they have. We as a city had that opportunity, again, to be a center of a sport. Here we had a Madison Square Garden. We had a Met, we had Barclay, we had, a, we had the Yankee Stadium. We had all those institutions that we feel they all can contribute much more. So again, this is not about creating something that we had never had in the past. This is about bringing back the mayor's office of a sport and recreation that will be responsible to put a strategy, to put an initiative together, to provide that opportunity for our children and our youth to get all the support that they need to develop the sport talents that they have. So, gracias. Estamos aquí en un momento donde vamos a escuchar un proyecto de ley para crear la oficina de deporte y recreación para que los niños y los jóvenes de escasos recursos económicos tengan los apoyos necesarios que ellos necesitan para poder competir en todas las áreas. Again, when we hear from the administration, as I spoke to them, it's not about what we're doing through PARC, what we're doing through DOE, or what do it, we're doing through DYCD. It's about centralizing all those resources so that we can elevate the level of opportunity for youth when it comes to competitive sport in New York City. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. We are also joined by Council Member Van Bremer and Council Member Levine. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. 
during the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to, de to testify. So please listen for your name to be called as I'll periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Parks and Recreation will be Margaret Nelson, Deputy Commissioner for the Urban Park Service and Public Programs, Ken Conyers, Deputy Chief of Recreation, Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations, and Patricia Perone, Chief of Staff and Park Service and Public Programs. At this time, I'll administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I'll call on you each individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Nelson? I do. Thank you. Mr. Conyers? I do. Thank you. Mr. Drury? I do. Ms. Perone? I do. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite uh, Deputy, Deputy Commissioner Nelson to please present her testimony. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Ku and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I am Margaret Nelson, Deputy Commissioner of Urban Park Service and Public Programs. Joined with me are Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations, and Ken Conyers, Deputy Chief of Recreation for Manhattan, who is heavily involved with permit issuance. Thank you for inviting me to testify today regarding the Parks Department's athletic field permit process. At New York City Parks, our mission is to offer resilient and sustainable parks, public spaces, and recreational amenities for present and future generations. Making our athletic facilities available to the public is a significant way in which we fulfill that mission, as is the care and maintenance of those facilities. We are the steward of over 1,000 athletic fields and over 4,000 athletic courts. In typical years, the agency issues approximately 8,300 athletic field permits annually, which represents just over 900,000 hours of playing time. It is our agency's responsibility to provide athletic permits to hundreds of schools, youth leagues, and adult recreation leagues for use of the fields all over the city. Our athletic field permit holders are as vast and varied as the population of New York City. Approximately 1,000 youth leagues, 400 schools enrolled in the Public School Athletic League, PSAL, an additional 400 schools affiliated with leagues other than PSAL, and 600 adult leagues, all hosting games and practices of a wide variety of competitive sports. The agency, we believe, has made significant strides in recent years making the athletic field permitting process less cumbersome, more transparent, and more equitable for our users. For example, since the last council hearing on ball field permitting in 2018, the agency launched a user-friendly searchable field and court availability map. This tool helps permit applicants and permit holders the ability to see current usage and open availability for a field or court. In addition, the tool allows members of the community the ability to see when their local field is unpermitted and therefore available to them for recreation. We strive to create a simple and straightforward permit system. Each season, fall, winter, spring, summer, has an application period where anyone interested in obtaining a permit can go to our website and apply. We also accept paper applications at our ball field permit offices if needed. We do not have a, a ball field permit application fee. Youth permits are always free and adults pay an hourly fee. Once the application period is over, the applications are reviewed by our staff. 
Applications are prioritized starting with returning youth and official school leagues, followed by returning adult permit holders, then finally any new permit requests prioritized first for youth leagues and then for new adult leagues. We do our best to permit fields for individuals interested in starting a new league or program by identifying open field space that may be suitable and by working with existing permit holders that may not need all allocated hours. Some new organizations have trouble securing time at their preferred fields, but we often are able to work with them to find space so they can build their program to serve the youth in the community. After permit review, patrons are contract, contacted about their requests and permits are issued based on availability of field, dates, times, and payment received. Permit holders must agree to and sign our sports permit guidelines, which delineates our rules and regulations. In winter season, we only permit synthetic fields due to the damage that can be caused on our natural turf fields in inclement weather. In 2019, we received uh, 15,151 permit requests, which was an increase of over 2,000 requests from the previous year. We were able to issue approximately 8,400 approvals from these requests. This increase in requests may be explained by our technological upgrades to the application system, making it easier to navigate the field and court availability map and permit priority guidelines establishing well-defined application periods and expanded seasonal play to accommodate growing demand. New York City Parks makes every effort to fairly accommodate as many requests for fields and courts as possible for each season. We receive thousands of permits requests many of them for the same fields and times, and we make every attempt to distribute permits equitably. Since 2016, we have seen a steady increase in the number of applications and approvals. We work in close coordination with our Parks Enforcement Patrol to ensure that permit rules are being followed, confirm that groups are using their permitted time appropriately, and minimize instances of permitted time going unused. In an effort to better monitor compliance with all athletic fields, rules and regulations, prior to COVID, the agency, the agency implemented a targeted inspection pilot program where parks enforcement officers in each borough conducted field inspections during the spring 2019 season. Our data showed that uh, 1,122 inspections were completed citywide uh, and the effort resulted in the complete revocation of a baseball athletic field permit for an adult league, totaling 189 hours of playing time. Additionally, 14 leagues lost field time because they weren't using the time allocated to them. A combined total of 545 hours were taken back from those 14 leagues. Inspections were scheduled to resume in March of 2020, but priorities shifted to the COVID response. In 2020, we created an application to track inspect, inspection data focused mainly on COVID compliance. Overall, we found most permit holders to be in compliance with our COVID guidelines delineated in our COVID affirmations document for which we require signature upon permit issuance. We look forward to exploring other uses for the application and potentially expanding its functionality in the future. COVID related restrictions impacted most of our 2020 permitting process. Right at the beginning of our spring summer season, on March 23rd, we suspended all permits. Following state guidance and consult consultation with the City Department of Health, the decision was made on May 13th to cancel all permits for the rest of the season, which ends on August 31st. Throughout this time, our parks were being heavily used in an unprecedented way. We had to restrict access to certain park amenities in an attempt to decrease spread of the virus. Fields were available on a first come first serve basis and we encouraged the public to share the spaces with their fellow New Yorkers. To the best of our ability, we worked with public and private open space stewards to increase accessibility to as many open spaces as possible. We also offered a plethora of virtual programming, everything from fitness classes to environmental education to keep people moving and engaged. As the COVID landscape continued to evolve and in, a, in an attempt to anticipate a fall season, we held a truncated fall application period from June 15th to July 31st. 
On September 15th, we started issuing fall permits to youth leagues only and did not issue any adult permits. All permit holders were required to sign an athletic affirmation form, which dictated new guidelines based on known COVID restrictions and best practices. On November 19th, when the city reached a 3% seven day average of positive COVID tests and the mayor closed schools, we suspended all permits through the close of the fall season, which ended on November 30th. On December 3rd, we began issuing winter permits for both youth and adults. We are currently in our winter season, which ends on March 16th. We have begun issuing permits for spring summer season for baseball, softball, cricket, racket games, field hockey, soccer, non-contact lacrosse, flag football, track and ultimate disc. High contact sports like football, basketball, volleyball, rug rugby, and contact lacrosse are not being permitted at this time due to COVID transmission concerns. As the COVID landscape begins to change in the coming months and with the new vaccinations and better weather inviting increased participation in our public spaces, New York City Parks remains committed to the health and safety of our visitors. Permitting decisions are not made in a vacuum. They are made in close coordination with guidelines and best practices from health authorities at the state, local, and federal level. We completely understand the desire to get outside and exercise and the desire to get back to what we once called normal. However, great care must be taken to ensure the safety of everyone on our fields and playing surfaces. The COVID pandemic has also highlighted New Yorkers desire to access to their parks. We understand the needs of communities and have worked hand in hand with community leaders to build great, greater capacity in our permitting system. Wherever feasible, we add lighted fields and courts to extend permitted hours. In the last two years, we've installed field lights at one field and installed sports lighting at two basketball courts. We've also created a synthetic turf maintenance team that works to maintain and extend the usable life of our over 200 synthetic turf fields throughout the city. This administration knows how important it is to build new fields to serve New Yorkers. We invested 150 million to renovate five beloved neighborhood parks, which in every case included upgrading or creating new field space. In Astoria Park, we heard the community's need for an upgraded soccer field, and we were able to meet that need by converting a natural turf field to synthetic turf field soccer, soccer field and track. We also completed a new synthetic turf field I'm sorry, synthetic turf soccer practice field in Highbridge in Manhattan, and that's the picture behind me, and renovated a natural turf field in St. Mary's in the Bronx and upgraded a natural turf soccer and football field to synthetic turf in Betsy Head in Brooklyn, which is also striped for lacrosse. Still to come in this project are two new soccer fields in Fresh Kills Park in Staten Island, which will also be striped to allow for other sports. In total, in the past few years, we have completed capital projects that include renovating or creating 15 synthetic turf fields citywide with more in the pipeline. New Yorkers are passionate about living active, healthy lives from soccer in the Bronx, flag football in Brooklyn, basketball in Manhattan, cricket in Queens, and youth baseball on Staten Island. Our fields are put to use every single day in every corner of the city. We are proud of the steps our agency has taken to make the permitting process for athletic fields more accessible, transparent, and equitable. Thank you for allowing me to testify before you today and for all of your continued advocacy for our city parks. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, and I would also just like to point out that when we're done with our section, we will definitely have staff from parks uh, be on the main Zoom call to just hear the public testimony. And I've also included in my testimony just a little bit of the schedule of when the different um, sessions are and when to apply. Thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Um, before we move on to questions from Chair Ku and Councilmember Rodriguez, uh, I would just like to note we, we, there was a technical glitch where we didn't quite get um, Ken Conyers' uh, affirmation. So I will just re-issue uh, the affirmation once again, Mr. Conyers, and just please respond afterwards. Um, just bear with me one second, please. Okay. Uh, 
do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Great. Thank you very much. And Thank you. And at this point, I will turn it over to Council Member Ku to ask questions. Thank you. Before I ask questions, I want to announce that we are also joined by Council Member Irwin. Uh, Commissioner Nelson, thank you very much uh, and your team coming here to testify. Um, So my question to, to you, the first question uh, is, how many permits for the use of athletic fuels are issued by DPR in a given season prior to COVID? So it does vary by season, um, but in general, I don't, I'm not sure I have it broken down by like spring, summer, fall, and winter. Can you, I can, would you say winter, can you do a breakdown by spawn small. or by borrow? By spawn or by borrow? Uh, so what I can give you is, um, say for 2019, um, where we approved 8,400 permits, uh, we approved is that is that helpful? Like how many permits per year per borough we approved? So okay. we approved in Manhattan uh, 3328. In Bronx, it was 737. In Brooklyn, it was 2129. In Queens, it was 1709. In Staten Island, it was 249. Uh, so those were the numbers by borough. And in general, um, we approved approximately 50, 50 to 60% of all permits requested. Uh, and it was pretty standard across each borough. What about by sport? Do you have it by sport? Like the soccer, baseball, uh, uh. I don't think I have it oh, by tennis, sport, but we no. can certainly get that to you after the hearing. Okay, thanks. So does the department track complaints made against permit holders for violations of permit conditions or other part, uh, uh, rules? So do you track the complaints? So, so we have a couple of ways that we try to track uh, our permit holders and, and how things are going. So uh, we do say on our permit that if um, a permit holder is seeing a violation by, you know, when they're out on the field, if they see a different league or a different team in violation, they're not supposed to have the field. They're, they, we're telling everyone they should report that to 311. Um, and so 311 is one of the ways that we register complaints, both by permit holders or by members of the public. Um, and those complaints, depending on the nature of the complaint, they usually go immediately to our PEP officers to respond to. So we've seen, uh, I would say in a normal year, we might get certain complaints where a league has shown up to use a field and they find that there's a pickup game going on or there's other folks who are not supposed to be there and they're having trouble getting them off. So they can call PEP for that. Um, so that's one way that we uh, kind of are trying to help our permit holders. I would say the other thing we do to, to monitor our permit holders, and again, I mentioned this in my testimony, is that we've started to do some more um, kind of official monitoring and spot checking. So we started that based on when the council passed their AED law, which requires uh, softball and baseball uh, leagues to have AEDs on site. 
Uh, so that started a process where we're checking, we're going out to those fields and checking to make sure the AEDs are there and that somebody who is trained on the AED is there. So that started in the spring of 19. So we have data from that. And what we did find is that um, 90 percent of the time when a, when a team was there and playing uh, that they were in compliance so we think that is a good start but we we do um, we are moving towards having more regular checks and more data about what we're seeing when we go out so this this fall as I mentioned we also started uh, uh, having pep go out um, and really checking for COVID compliance and again we were trying to check about 15 percent of fields a week um, for COVID compliance. And again, we found um, approximately 94% when there were uh, teams on the field that they were in compliance with COVID regulations and had their permit and were the right team on the right field at the right time. So I would say in, in both of those situations, we have seen some amount of fields not being used uh, when they are permitted. So sometimes that happens, you know, it could be the weather, it could be they're in a away game, but that is something that I think as an agency, we are looking to work on going forward even more as we start doing these inspections, because we want to make sure that when a league has a field that they are using it, because if they're not, we'd like to make sure it's available uh, for another league or team to use. So, so Commissioner, so there are, there are pet offices specifically uh, dedicated to address permit complaints, right? So there are some so, offices. We're, we're not doing it with specific officers. We actually, um, our, our officers are now all equipped with phones, with mobile phones. And we have an app on the phone and kind of all officers kind of as they're out in the field, some number of them are going to be, are, are doing some spot checks. So it's not a specific unit doing the spot checks. As you know, we have officers kind of based in in the boroughs, in different commands in the borough, I would say for every each of those PEP commands and subcommands, sometime during the week, officers are doing spot checks. No, uh, so as something um, related to to the to the permits, uh, pet officers when they are on the field or in the parks, are they also enforcing other regulations like uh, sometimes they are unlicensed vending? Uh, in parks, uh, uh, do they uh, do enforcement at the same time while they're there? They see something, someone yeah, selling. Yes, they're, they're basically out in their general operation. So they might be stopping by a field to check on the permit, but if they're in, on their way to that uh, field and they see something else they need to crack there, they're totally able to do that. Um, and it, it's part of their, they're just, we're just kind of adding it into their daily operations. Yeah, because I have heard complaints from like parks, like uh, um, conservancy groups, that there are no enforcement on like vending, uh, unlicensed vending in certain parks. You know, so I hope you are, this will bring to your attention. I, I will. I will bring that back. Um, I would say that, given COVID, there has been a lot more focus by PEP officers on uh, you know not so much now, but definitely in the spring and the summer, they were doing a lot of compliance around uh, COVID violations and, and crowding conditions. And, you know, when we had our closed features in parks, making sure people weren't in those features that were not open. So they had a lot more uh, work that they were doing in the spring and the summer related to COVID compliance and handing out masks uh, than they had, in, you know, because of the, the pandemic. So, so uh, how many violations, how many complaints were made last year about violations or permits? So, again, we collect through 311 and uh, we don't have it necessarily broken down by which type of violation, but I think that is something we're going to look to do in the future. I would say in the past year, maybe we've gotten, you know, 80 to 100, but a lot of those were actually social, like people complaining about social distancing complaints on a field, like people are playing soccer without masks or things like that. So um, I think we need to do more of a kind of a parsing. So I don't have that breakdown right now for you. Uh, so can you get me, get it to us later? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. But your question is specifically, 
how many how many complaints did we receive for violations of a permit holder? Yeah, yeah, and then how many were investigated? No. Yeah, uh, again, because sometimes people call three one one, and then maybe nobody go uh, go there and take a look. You know, sometimes because the pet offices are busy. So, uh, so how many like how many uh, complaint would you receive the complaint, and how many are investigated? Um, got it. I, I would say in just the general review of the data, there were very few complaints about a field being used by somebody that was not the perm by, by a different league. I think there were a lot of complaints about pickup games happening when, some, when a, a permitted user was trying to use the field. I think there were a lot of complaints related to social distancing, um, but we, we didn't see in general a lot of complaints about a different you know, league or, or, or organized group using a field, but we'll definitely check on that and get back to you. Uh, Commissioner, no. Today's testimony, uh, you didn't mention anything about bill sponsored by uh, the bill number is 1959, sponsored by Council Member Rodriguez to create an uh, office of sports recreation. Uh, how come you don't have any? You didn't mention anything in your testimony. Uh, I'm going to turn that over to Matt to comment on the bill. Thank you. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, hi, council member, can you hear me? Yeah, this, uh, so uh, Matt Drury, yeah, director of- Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. So yes, uh, so, uh, you know, my apologies for any confusion. Obviously, uh, you know, Commissioner Nelson was kind of speaking to sort of the primary oversight uh, uh, subject, but I'm uh, absolutely pleased to talk about, obviously the, the introduction uh, we're, we're familiar with. As I think you heard in our testimony today, uh, we share, you know, the sponsor's passion and the council's passion for promoting sports recreational activities. We wanna increase uh, opportunities for sports recreation throughout the city. Uh, that's true at the local and community level, you know, that's at our recreation centers, our courts, our fields, uh, both for league activities, as you're hearing a lot about today, but also, you know, pickup sports are obviously a light, you know, part of the lifeblood of New York City. Um, in fact, it's also true for some real world class sporting events, you know, uh, quasi professional or, 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 or amateur that take place at our facilities, you know, the USA track and field indoor championship, uh, which has come to Ocean Breeze uh, athletic complex in Staten Island, really exciting. Uh, you know, something of a, a real big draw, you know, drawing, drawing teams from, from all over the country. Um, so the long story short is we, we absolutely 100% agree that sports uh, recreation is, is vastly important. We really appreciate uh, and, uh, uh, the intent of the bill. You know, we, uh, we want to look forward uh, to discussing it further with the sponsor and with the various other uh, city entities. Yeah, I, I think the, the bill has a really good uh, intention behind because uh, we, as a big city, we need to create a pipeline for future athletes, you know? Many children, they have special talents uh, or potential talents. But if we discover them early, uh, we can send them to camps or uh, special schools. Uh, actually, in other countries, this is national policy. No, I mean, I, I think in China, uh, if you are only three or four years old, if you have special talent of doing certain things, they will talk to the parents and say, hey, your kid has special talent of or, or some sure kind like gymnastics or, or ping pong or, or even martial arts or five years, six year olds, they will send them to special schools to train them for like uh, uh, for local competitions first. And then from local competition, they will go to uh, like state competition and then national competition. And then that's why they have a pipeline to go to the Olympics you know, or other uh, competitions. So I think this is a good idea that the city has a centralized place uh, to create a pipeline uh, to monitor and, and coordinate all these activities together. Uh, Councilman Rodriguez, do you have any questions for, uh, for Matt? I, I, I do, and thank you, Chair. And, and, that, and that's it, you know, as you will hear later on from the testimony, as I say, we will have Ken Baxiva who now is the, the executive director of Bike New York, mm -hmm. that he run the larger bike tour in, in the United States and the second one in the whole nation. He was the last one that was in charge. And, and I, want, I want to correct the typo because it's not a sport recreation. 
is the office of a sport and recreation. And, and because the idea is that, yes, like, you know, as, as most of us elected officials, we go through many parades, right? In League, League Baseball in, in, in League. And we go through all the sport. We go and throw the first ball in a basketball tournament. However, it is, you know, as a teacher that I was for 15 years, I'm all about pipeline. So when you were here from, from Ken Baxiba, who on the Bloomberg, he was the director of the New York City Sport and Recreation, you will hear how Mayor Bloomberg was committed to build a, a office that was in charge to market New York City around a sport. So what we have seen is we have a lot of institutions that they taking kids to win Olympic, like Astro Green, and again, like, you know, my daughter, she's in the swimming team there. And I know that at for Green, they do a lot of sport programming, as also we have the other institution that they do swimming in the George Washington. But one thing is about, you know, bringing kids, especially in this advantaged community, and train them to the lower level skill and expose them to everything that is around the sport. The other thing is following exactly what you're saying creating a pipeline. So based on what we know is that this thing that happened through, you know, DOE when it comes to a sport. The school that I used to be a teacher, Gregorio Luperon High School, they didn't play last year because of the COVID, but a year ago, they won the high school baseball championship in, in, in the city of New York, playing the Yankee Stadium. We as a city, we don't have you know, we don't have a, 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 a we don't have an office that is designated to put a strategy, to put initiative that can tell us right now, how many kids do we have in lower level, in middle level, a high school level that are, can be competitive. Again, my nephew used to play baseball. One of them is in Arizona. But the oldest one, he was in the Fordham University baseball team, which is college baseball division one. Here in the Bronx, 35 players and like three black, Latino, or Asian. A lot had to do with lack of pipeline. So my thing is, and, and I'm happy again that, that to know uh, that we, you know, uh, the city hall is open that we can have conversation and with the support of the chair and all the key players, not only from the speaker, my colleague, but also from Brooklyn Board President Eric Adam, who also support this initiative. It, you know, I'm happy to see that, that we will get it done. But my question is, if you can answer that question now, do, can you share with us uh, where do we have a level of centralized coordinations among city agency? And how do you see that this mayor's office of a sport and recreation can play that role to help to promote competitive sport in our youth in, in, in the city of New York? Yeah, I, I think it's an excellent uh, point, council member, and, and well, well stated. I think, you know, obviously, our agency, we're, we're abundantly proud. There are, you know, there are dozens, if not hundreds of, you know, sports legends that have gone on to success, you know, that, that initially, you know, learned their skills and honed their skills on New York City's fields and courts, whether it's Rucker Park or, or some of, you know, some of our great, you know, ball fields or our, our, our swimming facilities, tennis courts, what have you. So that's, you know, we're certainly proud of that success. Doesn't mean there couldn't always be more, right? Like thinking, and, and even beyond, you know, short of professional success, you know, that sort of development and, and you know, the, the life improvements that can come out of that, the educational lessons, teamwork, uh, you know, hard work, uh, those sort of, you know, dedication, those kind of, those kind of things are obviously priceless. So we, we, we uh, you know, I think that's, 100% uh, heard and, 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 and received very, very well. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that there is sort of a, you know, strategically, obviously it intersects with the city's efforts towards education, uh, health, you know, public health, obviously, uh, you know, uh, youth development. There are, you know, so many different aspects that, that sports plays an important role at. And we certainly work really closely with all of those entities on a variety of different efforts, but to the degree of whether there's sort of a, you know, one entity sort of mapping out a master strategy, you know, I guess, you know, at the time, you know, there's, there's not, you know, a, 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 you know, an office of that sort. Uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't uh, here 
when the, when the actual uh, sports commission was in place, uh, you know, obviously our, our staff will be on to listen to the public testimony. So we're, you know, and, and some of us were, are familiar with it in the past, you know, economic development, things, you know, things of that aspect mm -hmm. are so included. Um, so we're, you know, understandably, I think we're, we're open to hearing more and, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you. And, and, the, and the second part that I want to bring is that, you know, we also, what my experience is that, again, as a former teacher, a, as someone that had youngest brother, that, you know, and everyone knows, sport provides the discipline, you know, that children also need. I had youngest brother of mine that they were in, in the track and field aviation high school. Yes, he competed at the high school level. He didn't pursue in the field, but I think that a lot of the discipline that he got in this baseball, hoping now to be a captain in JetBlue, flying in another field. So it's about also, you know, all the discipline that is there. And also, I think that I, we do agree also that there's a gap in, when it comes to, you know, the middle and upper middle class New Yorkers able to, even as you know, like I know that Park is doing a great job. And, uh, and as you know, in Northern Manhattan, uh, my work is connected with the money. So I've been doing all the investment when it comes to our park because I do believe in that. But the other reality is that even in the tennis a, a conception that you give to son, you know, or the non-for-profit, you know, sport is expensive. And it's a different for a lower cut kid, a class A kid to say here I'm into swimming, I'm into baseball, I'm into soccer. When you pay $2,000 for the six months, the quality of training that you get is much higher than the other program that we have in other play, places in the city where they don't have the same resources. So I think that, you know, the whole idea of this is about how do we also connect with the private sector, all those sport institutions that we mentioned, and see how also with any foundation to say, guys, we need to connect our youth to more resources so that they can get more training to develop the skills. So I think that, you know, I just want to make the point as I see part as a key play in this, of, in this effort and, and to also, as we will move conversation with City Hall and the speaker that I thankfully, you know, he also support this initiative, Speaker Corey Johnson, that also we can identify details and see more than, than recreation. And that's what I say, it's not, a, it's not a sport recreation. It's not only about the conversation here, it's not about Let's continue this expanding this effort so that more youth are in the park and not losing the time in the street. It's not about that. It's about competitive. It's about Roy New York. You know, when they came to, to uptown and thanks to Amanda that now move at the national level, I had a conversation with her. I said, Roy is not part of the, of the Dominican youth in Northern Manhattan because Dominican is more connected with baseball and basketball. But when she came in and she, think outside the box. And she put a rowing program connecting youth in Northern Manhattan. There was youth from Northern Manhattan that had never rowed in the river, winning a statewide competition, and at the same time, being competitive to get good scholarship. So I don't know, you know, there's anything that you'd like to add about that approach about also bringing the non-for-profit, supporting them, and also bringing the private sector. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent point. And Row New York is an incredible example, obviously. We'll look forward to hearing more from them uh, later. Uh, you, you know, but I think the, the you know, Parks, is, Parks certainly is always, you know, pursuing and actively, you know, interested in, you know, those kind of partnerships with private entities to help, you know, help fund opportunities for either, you know, facility improvement or, you know, provide programming. And also, the, you know, uh, the hundreds of nonprofit partners we have uh, providing really incredible opportunities for kids, especially the youth. Uh, providing, you know, an access to a new activity that, you know, maybe folks 10, 20 years ago said wouldn't, wouldn't have made sense, you know, in that neighborhood X, Y, Z. But, you know, I think we've seen that, you know, when you, when you, when you allow those opportunities to be offered to folks and, you know, the, you know, you can really see some, you know, amazing transformative impacts, you know, in, in, in our youth. And I think we, you know, that that's exciting and, and we want to sort of explore that, you know, to every degree possible. Thank you. And thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rodriguez. Now, can we go back to Commissioner Nelson? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Um, Commissioner Nelson, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here. 
Oh, okay. So uh, let me go back to uh, more questions about the permits. Yeah. Oh, okay. Before that, we are also joined by council member John Lai. Um, what are the fees that are charged for the different kinds of permits? And how are those fees determined? I mean, I know most of the fees, most of the permits are free, but some, some uh, they had to pay, right? Yeah, so again, if the field is going to be used by youth as defined as, you know, I think it's 18 or under, 17 or under, it's a youth league, it's a youth team. Um, there's no application fee to apply for a permit. There is no fee to use the field. If it is an adult league or adults are going to be playing on the field, uh, we have a, uh, a schedule of fees, uh, which I can share with you. So if the ball field has lights, so it can be played on kind of into the evening because it has lights, it's $25 an hour. Uh, cricket, football, uh, lacrosse, rugby, soccer, and ultimate Frisbee fields are $16 per hour. Uh, baseball, softball, and volleyball, turf and soft surface fields are $12.50 an hour. Um, basketball, baseball, softball, roller hockey, and volleyball, again, this is for permitting as opposed to just pick up play, is $8 an hour. Okay. Thank you. So are there any uh, punitive measures uh, that can be taken by DPR against a permit holder who has violated any permit conditions? Uh, are the permits being revoked or are there any criteria for uh, revocation? Uh, again, we wanna make sure our fields are being used um, for athletic purposes uh, by as many people as possible, by as many groups as possible. So if we get a report that a league is not using their fields or is doing something inappropriate, we would first really reach out to them to find out what they're saying. Because ideally we wanna work with our teams and our, and our leagues to kind of first try to work out uh, an amenable solution. So if they say, oh, you're right, you know, we thought we'd need this time, but we don't, and they give it back and they give it back voluntarily, that's great. Or they say, oh, we thought we needed this, but actually we need something else. We try to work with them. But if we do find that we're, we're seeing repeated instances of leagues not using their fields, we will revoke that time. And that does mean that they would not be then grandfathered for that time going forward. Um, so we, we do take that charge very seriously in terms of being stewards of this, uh, these fields. Um, and that's something we definitely want, again, we cannot be everywhere all the time. So we need people to let us know what they're seeing um, and report to us. And I would say, again, our advances in our technology and our website, you know, have given a greater level of transparency to everyone. So anybody can go on and see who has a permit for, for that field at what time. So if somebody says, oh, I just was there and this is supposed to be permitted, but it's empty, they can report that to us and we can look into it. So we can either, as you mentioned before, you know, that might be a complaint that's not looked at by PEP that would go to the ball field coordinator to look into what's going on and they would reach out directly to the, to the holder of the permit. So we have revoked time. Uh, we will continue to revoke time. We use it as a last resort because again, some of these are you know, community leagues. We wanna, we wanna have a cooperative process with them. There might've been an error or mistake. We wanna first reach out, um, but we will move to that step of revoking permits um, overall, or at least some, you know, the time that they're not using. Um, similarly, for COVID, you know, we took our charge of, we wanted to provide space for people to play um, and have healthy, you know, activities, but we wanted to make sure people were following the COVID restrictions. Um, so as you said, we did say that there was a kind of a three strikes you're out rule on uh, for, for teams and leagues following our COVID guidelines. If we found that a team violated it three times, we were going to revoke uh, that permit for that team, not necessarily the whole league. Um, we did find 
um, in the fall and, and winter, there were 20 instances of teams really not following the COVID guidelines. Some handful got a second warning. Nobody went to a third warning and had it revoked. So for a uh, 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 permit holder who violated the, the rules, are they prevented from obtaining future permits? Say so suppose this team or this guy about uh, you caught them violated the rules of three times. So I would say that we, if we found somebody violating the rules in a way that was illegal or corrupt, like they were selling uh, their time to another, uh, another league, that's a serious violation and we would seek to revoke uh, their, their permit. Um, I would and their ask, future permit. I don't know if Ken wanted to, I, I'm gonna ask Ken who's closer to this process to talk about that again. If we find them violating, you know, if they're not using the field once, you know, or twice, we're not necessarily going to revoke their whole permit. We might, we're, again, we're going to start with trying to work with them to see what's going on and seeing if there's a way they would voluntarily give back some time. But I'm not sure there might be other instances where we would fully revoke uh, an entire permit for a league. Um, I'm going to ask Ken um, if he has anything to add to this. Okay. So that's. That's absolutely correct, Commissioner. We don't revoke, uh, we revoke permit by permit. We don't revoke all of uh, an individual's permits. So if somebody's not using that time, we catch them the three times not using it, we revoke that permit. They're not barred from uh, putting in additional permits and they're not barred from the other permits that they currently hold. Except for the case, like Commissioner Nelson stated, in regards to doing anything illegal or selling the permits. Then they're looked at as a, organization whole and all their permits, but not using time or revocations are done permit by permit, field by field. And, and just to clarify, which I had to learn as part of, you know, preparing for this hearing, like a league can put multiple fields and multiple times on one permit, or they can ask for multiple permits for different uh, fields. So, so that's why you see kind of a large volume of permits and maybe why you have you know, a, a high volume of permits not approved. It doesn't mean the league isn't getting any time. It means that maybe you know, they put in a, a different permits for different fields and they didn't get all of their permits. Okay. So when the pen officers and I go on their jobs, do they spot check uh, people pay on the fields whether they have permits? or whether they uh, comply with the rules and conditions? I would say that they are going out with a list of what fields they're going to check for the day and they know what the permit holders are and they're going there specifically to check. I, I don't think if they come across somebody playing on a field, they're necessarily going to then go to that field and check that unless there was a complaint. Okay, so so next question is, uh, since PARCS is apparently ready to start processing permit applications for spring and summer for some non-contact spots, is there a timeline as to when contact sports permitting, example, uh, football, basketball, uh, uh, lacrosse, maybe start uh, in um, 2021? Yeah, we, we do not have a timeline yet. Um, I think we will continue our conversations with the Department of Health about when it might be safe to restart those sports in the city. Uh, but at this point, uh, the collective determination is that we're not ready to do that. So you haven't set up the criteria yet? Uh, my, my sense is that uh, we're starting to permit the sports that we talked about before. And then when uh, kind of based on the Department of Health uh, determination, when it's safe to bring back those sports, we would let those sports start and they would have to sign the same COVID affirmation that we're using for all permitted sports. So it would probably be just like a, a start, not anything intermediate in terms of so do, putting additional. So 
Do you expect vaccines to be mandated for all participating uh, at some point in the future? Like especially for the close contact spots. Okay. Do you anticipate you um, you need I have, full I have vaccine? Not heard of that. Um, but again, I think we really look for the Department of Health to take the lead on kind of who should be vaccinated and on what schedule. And, and we work with them on, on that. They're the health experts and, and we defer to their judgment. Uh, so for the restrictions and protocols requiring to particip participate in close contact sports, you will defer to Department of Health? Um, again, my sense is that for close contact sports, you can't really do those sports without the close contact. And so you want to wait until the COVID rates are low enough that it is safe to do those close contact sports. Um, I don't know. I mean, that would be, we can like talk to the Department of Health and get more information on what that process might look like and get back to you. Okay. Yeah. So when we receive a, a complaint, when you receive complaints to 311 about uh, obstructing public use in parks. And, and since like these complaints are going up in the last few years, with the exception of 2020 because of the COVID, uh, are all these complaints related? Um, people complaining about unauthorized use of athletic fields? If so, what steps can your department uh, uh, to take to reduce these complaints? So I guess in um, uh, calendar year 2020, there were about 70 complaints in our 311 system related to fields. And again, I think a lot of those, but we're gonna get you the breakdown uh, we're, we're more related to social distancing or pickup games being on the field uh, when somebody was looking to use their permit. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't think we've seen increases in complaints over time, but we will definitely check on that and get back to you. I think it's been fairly steady, probably a little bit of an increase uh, this last year, mostly due to COVID related complaints in terms of social distancing on fields or people not wearing masks. Yeah, before COVID, it was uh, on the rise. You know, the complaints are going up, but because of COVID, it stopped at you know, level down. So my question is, you know, what steps are you guys taking to to handle these complaints? So does does DPR need more enforcement and officers specifically dedicated to enforce permit violations? So. We have two, two ways of dealing with complaints. Um, so again, if a call comes in um, and a PEP officer is available to go and investigate, they will do that. Um, there's a large number of times where we can send an officer to investigate that. Um, or there might be, it might be the kind of complaint that goes to the permit coordinator in that borough to investigate uh, because it's not a time sensitive. It's not like something's happening on the field right now. And so then it would be up to the permit coordinator to follow up on that complaint um, and take action. And then again, if it's a, a very serious complaint about some sort of fraud or corruption, we would refer that to DOI for investigation. But we have, to my knowledge, we have not um, had any of those kinds of complaints in the last several years. So uh, is there a signage system uh, in the park or on the web-based uh, system on the internet that can inform people in real, in real time as, as to who is authorized to be at the field or court at a given time? Can people like walk by say, no, I can go on my cell phone and find out who are these guys playing on the field because they are not doing the right things, no? Yeah, no, I think, and again, I, I think this was this kind of transparency and wanting to have more access to this information was something that was brought up at the last council hearing in 2018 on field, the field permit system. I think we share 
your interest in trying to make um, what is admittedly kind of a complicated system. We have a lot of fields, you have a lot of hours, you have a lot of teams. I want to at first, I want to kind of give a shout out at this hearing to the 10 you know, field coordinators citywide who are handling these thousands of uh, permit requests and working with leagues and teams to get them the time that they need. They're doing an amazing job. Um, but we, we agree with you in trying to make the system easier to navigate and more transparent. Um, and since the last hearing on the permitting process, we have created an online map. Uh, it's an interactive map. Anybody can go on it. You can go on it uh, on the computer with your phone and you can pull up in real time uh, who, who has a permit um, at that time. So we think that's really helpful for exactly what you said. So if somebody walks by and they wanna know who, who's playing, they should be able to see that. Um, again, if the field isn't permitted and someone's playing there, that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but they would also be able to see if somebody did permit it and it was empty, like that is a bad thing and we would want to follow up with that team if possible. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, now I want to turn the questions to my colleagues. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Moderator, thank you. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, before we move on to council member questions, I'd just like to note uh, for all who are attending the hearing that the Zoom hand raise function at this point is only for council members to ask questions. Rest assured anyone else from the public who is currently on this uh, hearing will be called on to speak at some point uh, during the hearing. So please uh, bear with us. Thank you. At this point, we will move on to questions from uh, other council members. Um, and we, uh, I will call on these other members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise, raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question uh, and have not yet used the raise hand function, please do so now, council members. Also, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Please begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before uh, moving on. Uh, at this point, uh, I will call on council member Diaz to ask questions. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you all today. My question specifically is to Margaret Nelson, the deputy, and it's a reference to homelessness and how it's affecting our parks. I, if it's not at this time, can you please follow up with an indicator are your numbers going up? Are they going down? And how do you deal with the homelessness? Last week, we, we had someone in one of our local parks that we had to deal with. And I'm glad I was able to put a team together to deal with him. Definitely um, suffering not only displacement of homelessness, but severe case of mental health issues. He was flashing children and seniors and, and so on. So I'm sure as it's happening here in the 37 council matic district is happening across the city. Thank you for that question, council member. Um, I don't have statistics here in terms of increase or decrease in homelessness and we don't really track kind of uh, homeless people who are using our parks because they're allowed to use our parks like anybody else. Um, but we do work very closely with Department of Homeless Services and other city agencies when as you say, somebody's doing something inappropriate or illegal, um, we, we want to respond to that right away. So uh, people should definitely report that, either 911 or 311. Um, we do work very closely with Department of Homeless Services um, in relation to people who might be sleeping overnight in our parks. We want to make sure they're getting the appropriate services. Um, and we do, um, you know, for code red and code blue, we check known homeless locations to make sure they're getting the services that we can, you know, try to provide them on those on those hot days or cold cold days. You know, and just to be clear on, on my question, parks are free, and coming from someone that are homeless for 13 years, I definitely welcome the use of, of the park by anyone. My question more is more so for the tents, you know, that that are developing within our communities. Thank you. I'd be happy to follow up with you offline about what you're seeing as well and how we can better address it. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
We'll now hear questions from Council Member Riley. At this point, if there are other members who have questions, please use the Zoom hand raise function. Council Member Riley. Time starts now. Thank you, Council, and thank you, Chair Kuhl. Uh, thank you to the Department of Parks for your testimony today. And I have a few questions um, pertaining to the summer tournaments. Uh, what measures are the Park Department taking to reinstall summer tournaments? And if so, how many permits will be permitted for summer tournaments like basketball tournaments, soccer tournaments? Because um, as we see right now, our high school athletes, especially being that they cannot engage in uh, in activity um, like they usually will or can't get exposure, um, they'll really be looking forward to summer tournaments to kind of get this exposure and to get the skills that they need to, you know, take their talents, you know, to take them to college or wherever professions they, they want to get into. So I just want to know what the Parks Department is doing uh, to reinstall summer tournaments. And if so, how many permits will be grant guaranteed this summer? So I think we would love to be able to have uh, summer tournaments this summer. I think we are still in the planning stages with the Department of Health about what is going to be safe and allowed. So we're, we're not really ready to share. We don't really have a plan yet. That's still in process. And I don't think we set a limit on the number of tournaments. We really try to accommodate um, a, as many uh, tournaments and, and, and community events that we can. Um, we do try to have a balance between having some open time in courts, you know, versus 100% scheduled. Uh, so that is one of the factors we try to keep in mind. But we do try to uh, work with uh, permit applicants to grant their requests to the extent possible. But in terms of, you know, tournaments, I think currently they're they're not allowed under the COVID uh, regulations. And you know, hopefully as our rates go down and things become safer, we can bring those back. And we look forward to doing that as well and providing youth that opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner Nelson. And my last question is, um, as we saw during the pandemic, uh, the parks were heavy, heavy utilized. Um, and we did, we did see abundance of garbage um, throughout the park. So I just wanted to uh, know, is there a strategic plan to keep our parks beautified um, during this summer that's coming up? Because we will know as soon as it gets nice out, especially to, for the amount of snow that we've been getting, uh, people will be utilizing the park. So is there a plan to keep our parks beautified? And the reason I'm asking is because I don't represent it, but it's outside my district, Pelham Parkway in the Bronx, which was extremely utilized during um, the summertime and during the COVID pandemic. But there was a bonus of garbage always there when people were trying to utilize the park. So is there a plan to keep our parks beautified during this um, until we get back to any form of normality? So... I think our maintenance and operations folks do an incredible job uh, trying to keep up with, you know, the parks became everybody's backyard, front yard, living room during the pandemic. Uh, I think that will continue. We've had incredible usage of the parks, which you can kind of track by the increased amount of garbage. And I think that uh, we're out there, we're cleaning, our staff is cleaning. I think we're looking to engage partnerships and community groups to help us with some of that effort. There's also a uh, I think a public education component to that of like if people can kind of pack in and pack out instead of leaving it there, if there's not enough room, that would be helpful. But I think we're, we're constantly strategizing and really seeing what you're seeing and trying to come up with ways that we can keep our parks as clean as possible so people can enjoy them this summer. Thank and Matt, you. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, no, I think that as, as noting the public uh, education pan campaign is, you know, we, we launched a, an anti-litter campaign earlier and that's going to be kind of taking on. So we'd love to partner with you in your office, helping us get the word out. You know, look, I mean, I think the message we kind of, you know, parks were clearly there for, you know, New Yorkers, you know, when things were toughest, we kind of need New Yorkers to be there in, in turn for their parks, right? So I think it's a shared responsibility. Uh, you know, we have the best staff in the world. They're, they're busting their butts, obviously keeping our, you know, but at the end of the day, we also, you know, we're all New Yorkers. We share these public spaces. We also need to all step up and do the right thing as well. So it's that, you know, working together uh, and, and uh, you know, want to work with you in, in discussing that further. Looking forward to it. And thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Next, we have questions from Council Member Holden. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you, Chair, for holding this important hearing. Um, Deputy Commissioner, I, I just want to talk about the enforcement of 
you know, the allegations, is, it's been going on for decades about allegations of brokering uh, permits, grandfathering permits. Even though the team or league may have disbanded, the permits continued. And what I found frustrating dealing with the process for over 25 years was, yes, like you mentioned, you had to get three cases where the permits were not being used by the organization or the league. And the documentation of it was very difficult because you had to get a park supervisor at, down to the field to see that the fields weren't being used. You couldn't submit photographs that are timestamped. You couldn't submit video. You had to get a parks supervisor there three times. And that, Deputy Commissioner, was practically impossible. So what would happen is this would continue and continue for a very long time. The fields were unused. So I was getting complaints from the, the teams that they had to travel all the way out to Long Island while their home field was sitting empty for weeks and weeks and weeks because we couldn't get a park supervisor out there. Has that changed at all in the last 20 years? Well, I have not been at parks for 20 years um, and I've been in this position for about two years. Um, I would like to say, so I'm gonna have, I'm not necessarily gonna comment on what happened before. Um, there definitely was this sense of like three strikes before we pulled it involuntarily a permit from someone. Well, what was the said, no, but can you answer the, what is required for the evidence? Does a park supervisor have to see that the fields are not being used? Um, I would say that it does not require a park supervisor since right now we're using our PEP officers to go out in the field and that, that can be used as well. So I think we are trying to expand who we have out in the field um, looking for these potential violations. And, and again, as we talked about, we don't have that many PEP officers versus the number of fields and the number of permits. So I would definitely say if, you know, you should share with us, and I'm sorry you've been, you know, doing this over 20 years, but I, I would like to take your concern seriously and look at the fields that you're talking about and the leagues you're talking about and really make it anywhere we're hearing kind of a pattern of repeated abuse. I think we should focus our resources, our spot checks on those areas um, to make sure we're, we're catching that uh, and rectifying it going forward. Well, I just think you should allow if there's, everybody has a smartphone now, it seems, everybody has a camera on it, that you could just take a video and say, look, it's this, there's a, a permit here for 10 a.m. I'm standing here at 1030 and the fields are empty. Uh, send it into parks. That's, that's legit. Um, and they could call the league and say, you, we don't, we have, um, um, information that you didn't give back these permits, you could have, which is rarely done in, in uh, the permit world. Because uh, again, it's, it's not changed, uh, Deputy Commissioner. And that's the problem we have to, that's why we're, ha we're having a hearing because we need to change this to the point where it, it becomes, where if a team or league is not going to use the permits, they call up parks and say, all right, just give this to somebody because we're not gonna use it on uh, the 15th. Uh, on Saturday the 15th, whatever it is, you're not at least have given enough advance, advance notice rather than just hold on to them and then kids have to travel all the way out to, to Long Island to get into, into a game in their own neighborhood. And that's what we've seen over and over again. I don't think it's changed. So but that's what we need from parks. And that's what I think, um, you know, uh, certainly the chairman is talking about that we need to, to figure out the process enforcement if a team is or a league is abusing the permits or brokering them or giving them to adult leagues, which happened, they're, they're a, a youth permit that they're giving to adult leagues and that's happened over and over again, which is a violation, that that needs to be documented and not a supervisor going down and looking at the field or a PEP because try to get a PEP officer, try to get a supervisor there for, in, in a two hour time slot is almost impossible on, a, on any kind of basis. So. Let's try to come up with, well, you're, you'll accept other evidence of the abuse. And I think that's where we need to be at this point in the 21st century. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I will say that we will look into that. And I hear what you're saying is like, if you call right now, Pep might not be able to show up within that window. But, but I do feel like 
doing more inspections, even if it's you know a limited number of inspections per week and going out there for those times will help us get that information in a way that we haven't before and that we have started to do that. And so, for example, when we started to do the AED inspections in 2019, we did find fields that were empty when they were permitted. And I think, but for COVID, we're, you know, COVID hit and we had to change gears and we're more, you know, I think it's a little more understandable if leagues kind of sign up for time and maybe aren't using it during COVID. But once we're out of COVID, I think it is a priority for this agency to do more um, and making sure fields are not being unused when they are permitted. Thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Holden. Uh, Commissioner, so my, my, I have one more question and then um, we will go to public participation. Um, it sounds like that because the pet officers are needed everywhere, then you don't need enough. You don't have enough pet officers. So do, do you need the support for us to say that we have to increase pet officers in the parks department because they are needed everywhere and there are so many responsibilities for them. I think our PEP officers do amazing work in our parks. Um, and I think like any resource, we have a limited resource of PEP officers. If we had more, we could do more. We appreciate the council when you have uh, given us funding to have more PEP officers. I know we're going into the budget cycle. So we look forward to those conversations, but it's also, you know, a very frankly, a very difficult fiscal environment. And so, we have, amazing, we have an amazing force right now. Uh, we have to target our enforcement. We have to prioritize our enforcement. I think we do a good job at that. Um, and so we, we use the resources that we have as best as we can. And I think, again, we're never going to get to be, have a PEP officer every time there's a permit, every hour of the day, every field. So we have to have some sort of targeted enforcement, whether it's the number we have now or slightly more or slightly less. We have to we have to manage that as effectively as we can, but we thank we thank the council for their prior support of the the PEP officers. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Can we go to a public participation? Yes, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the Sergeant at Arms has started a timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular pan panelist should use the raise hand Zoom function in Zoom and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. At this point, I would like to welcome uh, Adolfo uh, Morales to testify, followed by Nzinga Prescott. Time starts now. Okay. Yes, please begin. I'm ready. You may begin. Okay. Thank so, uh, thanks for me. Uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Q, Member uh, Council Member Rodriguez, Council Members, Park officials. Uh, my original testimony was just going to be about uh, the uh, bill 1959, which uh, we're pretty excited. I, I represent the United Athletic Association. We're an advocacy group uh, in the five boroughs. And we're really excited about uh, bringing back the uh, a new style, a new type uh, sports commission. Uh, we uh, ran the uh, the uh, sports commission uh, citywide uh, uh, mayor's cup for ten years, and uh, we uh, believe strongly and highly on on uh, recreational sports, amateur sports, and professional sports, and bringing that back in a big way to the city. And of course, making it uh, something that uh, the amateur athletes uh, have a big role in, in running and, and participating in. Uh, 
so we're excited about that. I'm in favor uh, and, and would be uh, uh, interested in participating in any uh, planning uh, and, and uh, uh, get involved any way I can to help. Um, on the, um, I wasn't going to testify on the uh, parks permit, Alan, but there's a couple of questions there that I have, and so I'd like to bring that up. Uh, I applaud the Parks Department over the years. I've been an organizer. I'm one of the also league organizers uh, uh, that have been doing this for 45 years. And uh, I applaud the Parks Department. They've done a lot of uh, good work, a lot of strides uh, in, in the right direction. Uh, to make it short and clear on in terms of the permit issues, I think the Parks Department needs to bring back or bring organizers closer together to the parks, meet with them on a regular basis, it would be a lot easier to identify who is doing a public service and who is not. That would, that would uh, cut through a lot of red tape and investigating. I mean, obviously, it would be easier to identify people who you know uh, and who are doing the right thing and who are not if you're meeting with them face to face. Uh, so we're, we're, we're excited and interested in uh, meeting with parks. Uh, our members are, and I, we encourage the parks to, uh, uh, to meet regularly with those, especially those that they suspect are doing wrong. Uh, they also uh, some issues about uh, that I'd like to discuss with the Parks Department at a future date, uh, where there's some fields that are being reclassified. Uh, there's an incident uh, where 300 participants were moved off a field and uh, so to allow eight people to practice on the field. Uh, and so that needs to be addressed. Uh, there are baseball, softball fields that are built strictly for that. There have been, uh, and, and oh, that's expired. Ah, thank you. I think you can finish up your, your comment. Oh, okay, so yeah, they, they, they uh, somehow have been reclassified and uh, uh, those athletes are not able to use uh, those fields for what they were intentionally, built, or what they originally were built for. And uh, there are just people practicing on them on certain nights. And so we'd like to, you know, talk more about that and, and find out how we could correct that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next up is Nzinga Prasad, who will be followed by Mara Maza. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, Committee on Parks and Rec. Thanks for hosting this hearing. Thank you to Councilmember Rodriguez for introducing the bill uh, to discuss the Office of Sports and Recreation further. My name is Nzinga Prescott. I'm a two-time Olympian and world medalist in fencing, born and raised in Brooklyn. I've been organizing and strategizing with Councilmember Rodriguez's team as a subject, ad subject matter expert in sport. I've been in sport for more than 20 years. Um, my mom believes sport was, was a tool for developing strong character. And so she enrolled my sister and I into the Peter Westbrook Foundation. And we're lucky enough to have Peter on the call and he'll be speaking in a few. Um, but Peter's program afforded me a once in a lifetime opportunity to participate in elite training with premier coaches, which my mom wouldn't have been able to afford otherwise. Fencing was one of my greatest gifts. Through fencing, I learned my power and developed discipline, resilience, and maybe most importantly, purpose. Fencing opened the doors to excellence in sport, academics, and professionally. I graduated from Stuyvesant and Columbia. I've traveled the globe and had incredible experiences like walking in opening ceremonies and meeting the Obamas. Through fencing, I secured my consulting job at EY, and now I'm a proud community leader. All this to say, sport was a blessing, but I was certainly an anomaly growing up as an elite athlete in the outskirts of Flatbush. The disparity of access to this form of education is clear. There is a ceiling on the opportunities and possibilities presented to my peers in a predominantly black public school. Sports operate on a pay to play model which systemically excludes who can compete. And that burden often falls on black and brown communities. I'll be sending additional material um, that will be circulating that further details this disparity. And so it's always been my mission inspired by Peter's role in my life to scale my experience because there are so many capable children in the city who are never given the chance to fill this potential. So a city agency dedicated to youth sports from recreational to high performance is not a novel concept as Chairman Ku um, mentioned earlier. Many countries operate sports 
um, of all levels and it's a, and a universal offering. Um, the amended bill you'll receive broadly outlines how this can be a reality. It proposes coordination between existing stakeholders and resources to maximize impact. From working with city planning to grant elite programs, serving under-resourced communities access to city facilities, to realizing these sport development pipelines through rethinking physical education in public schools to expose youth to organized sport. Well, like Chairman Ku mentioned, children should have the opportunity to explore a range of sports to discover their talents. This is possible through coordination with the DOE, the DYCD, um, and the Parks Department. Ballet Tech, a middle school offering intensive ballet is a great model for what is possible in the form of a sports academy. Time has expired. Sorry, can I have a few more seconds? Um, can I continue? Finish your, finish your statement, please. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, the office can work with the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee and build strategic partnerships with nonprofits, corporations, and universities with the goal of providing options for any child to pursue sport at the, op the highest level. Thanks for listening and hope to have subsequent conversations to discuss how we can innovatively develop this office. Thank you very much. And Councilmember Rodriguez would like to speak. Wow. I can see a bitter face and see his happiness because I have lived that experience as a former teacher that when you see your student moving forward and you know the struggle that we go through, I don't think that anyone that doesn't live that experience can even know what we go through. And when we see a black and Latino kid, you know, we are not demanding space as a token. You know, we're demanding a fair share. And as we're talking right now, like I can give you like so many sampling, like Northern Manhattan, we don't have an indoor pool in the whole Northern Manhattan area. And that's not the spin that we live every day. So listening to a singer is about, I'm not gonna say the word, but it's about we got to do it. You know, we moving forward. Look at area in this community that is mainly composed by upper class. And you see the kid is posed and equipped with all those tools. And look at the underserved community. And then we expect that those kids at the age of 18 they will be at the same level. So a singer, like, what difference does it make in your own experience to get additional resources for you to get, you know, good people through foundation, private sector, that being able to give you the opportunity to get additional training? And how do you see that this office will be able to go to the private sector, to go to the public sector and say, can we add those additional services? So what was your experience with the additional resources that you got in order for you to develop yourself at the sport field and what impact it had in your life to be who you are today as a role model to many people, especially the generation such as my daughter, 14 and 18 and 8 years old that I know that they will be looking at you and you will have a lot to offer in a sport. Thanks for the question. Um, well, I, to be honest, I wouldn't have an, had any resources in fencing because I wouldn't have known about it. Um, Peter's program, Peter Westbrook's program has done a phenomenal job of changing the landscape of who has access to a sport like fencing, a uh, historically white, you know, predominantly white sport. Um, and so he's produced so many Olympic athletes. I'm one of many that he's produced. Um, and the, the exposure and the visibility, you know, at a young age, like Councilman, um, like Chairman Coops mentioned, is, is so important because how can you know um, those, the, that's a possibility for yourself if you don't, if you're not, if it's not accessible to you in your immediate vicinity. Um, so de definitely having a program like Peter's, but also 
being able to scale a program like Peter's to, to so more kids can have access to it is, is what I see a goal of the office to be and be able to um, sustainably provide that kind of service is, is what I see the, the opportunity is. And I think a lot of um, corporations um, and nonprofits can work together for this common goal. Their sports, sport is so universal. Um, there are so many people who would like to empower sport. And so we, it's really about tapping into those resources and aggregating them um, and maximizing the impact. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up is uh, Mara Maza. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Chairman Ku and Council Member Rodriguez and Zinga and the many council members attending here today. My name is Mara Maza and I'm the Communications Director at Kings County Tennis League. There's an urgent need to address the inequitable access to play in sports opportunities for underserved populations in New York City, especially in our black and brown communities. And the COVID-19 pandemic exposed and exacerbated the youth sports system even more. Children need and have a right to play. Social and emotional learning through sport is as important to childhood development as learning in the classroom. Access to play in youth sports is a racial justice issue. There are higher rates of disease and lower sports partition, participant rates in the black and brown communities. And these discrepancies can stunt the future economic empowerment of our underserved communities. Any bill about a new sports and recreation office would be incomplete without an explicit focus on accessible sports programming to reach these communities. KCTL, Kings County Tennis League, is one of the many sports-based youth development organizations in New York City. Uh, more than 95% of our student players are children of color, 35% live in public housing. KCTL removes all the barriers to tennis by creating or renovating underused play spaces in and around NYCHA developments in central Brooklyn. And we bring our staff, our volunteers, equipment, and programs to where our students reside. Now, tennis is often perceived as a country club sport. We had to address this stereotype with our students' families because in the beginning, they felt tennis was not their sport. Ten years later, I can assure you there is a thriving junior tennis community at each of our NYCHA program sites, and each student is a very proud member of it. In New York City, lack of available play spaces hinders equal access and opportunity to youth sports. Given that people living within a mile of a park are four times more likely to use it than those who live farther away, our model is a resourceful solution. For the health and welfare of our children, more community-based play opportunities need to become available that are of low cost and close to children's homes. Make this investment in youth sports, help rebuild and strengthen our underserved New York City communities during this challenging time of post-COVID recovery. Thank you again for your consideration. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from uh, David Ludwig of Asphalt Green, followed by Rachel Citron of Road New York. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Ku and members of the council, and thank you for holding today's important hearing. I'm David Ludwig, Senior Director of Community Programs at Asphalt Green and I'm testifying today in strong support of Intro 1959. Asphalt Green is a nonprofit organization that runs competitive sports programs for over a thousand youth athletes across the city, as well as providing instructive and introductory programs that reach tens of thousands of children each year. There is a great need in New York City for the proposed, proposed mayor's office and Asphalt Green fully supports its creation. Sports have the power to change lives, and they bring people of all ages and backgrounds together in activities that build positive relationships, life skills, and healthy habits. At a time when so many people are in need of positive social interactions, the creation of this office has the potential to make a significant impact on the lives of countless New Yorkers, especially our young people. Asphalt Green is committed to increasing the profile and presence of sports and recreation throughout New York City, especially in some of its most underserved areas. As a stakeholder in this office's endeavors, we pledge to join forces and collaborate to make New York City a, health, a healthier place for children through increasing access to the highest quality sports programming in the country. 
As an organization that works on both ends of the competitive spectrum, both giving children their first chance to swim or dribble a ball and coaching youth athlete, athletes to Olympic medals and collegiate scholarships, we are confident that the investment necessary to deliver on this office's charter will repay itself many times over. By increasing quality of life and health and raising our city's profile as a destination for excellence in sports, this office will ensure New York City remains the greatest city on earth for generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I also want to thank Councilmember Rodriguez and his staff for championing this effort uh, and for offering Asphalt Green and other sports nonprofits the opportunity to collaborate on this legislation. Thank you. And Councilmember Rodriguez does have a question. Yeah. Thank you, David. And 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 I know first time, you know, on disclosure that in the important quality uh, program that you as the Astro Green uh, provide to our youth and also the effort that you make going extra mile also to connect youth and also already in the Bronx, Northern Manhattan, and all the area. Uh, uh, to uh, different sport, but especially in swimming. Uh, I was there at six in the morning for no Astro Green as well for my daughter to come out from practice. So I I, I leave my spring for her. And, and, and I know that uh, Coach David and the Reds, you guys, you know, being, you are here in the city. Can you share a little bit about how this office can be helpful, especially since you guys and you were here we were here from other swimming institutions too, because, but if you can share about the work that you have done also producing some swimmer to compete at the Olympic and how a, 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 a office that will be strategizing and put an initiative together around a sport can even hope much more institution like your to also expand that opportunity so that we can see more New Yorkers train at the Astro Green to compete at the Olympic, uh, to participate in Olympic competition. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, you know, we have a scholarship funded Asphalt Green for uh, competitive swimmers um, from underserved neighborhoods. And what we, what we see year in and year out is that there's, you know, we don't have, we're not seeing enough kids come up from um, from to that competitive level. And so we need more pre-competitive programs out in communities. And um, in, uh, before COVID, we were teaching about 4,000 kids a year to swim um, in a bunch of different locations, but that's not enough. You know, um, it's not enough to build the interest um, and, uh, in, in competitive swim and to foster the kind of support uh, needed to, to get up to the competitive level. And I think that this office can just make a lot of connections. Like all the, all the organizations on this call are all doing amazing work. And in some regard there, you know, we're, we're always trying to partner, but, but somewhat isolated. And I think a mayor's office could have, could have some real leverage and kind of teeth and, and, and garnering resources and kind of making those connections. Uh, so to get the middle ground from the, the introduction to the sport through the, like the competitive pathway up. So we're really excited by this. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Rachel Citron followed by Phil Konigsberg. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rachel Citron. I'm the executive director of Row New York. In case you're unfamiliar with us, Row New York is the only organization in the five boroughs that makes the sport of rowing accessible to all New York City youth. And we do this in a way that's inclusive of all backgrounds and abilities. And much like KCTL, we're working in a sport that's historically a white sport and that many students of color are not familiar with um, until we get them involved. I'm testifying today on behalf of Row New York and 10 additional New York City sports space youth development organizations, which are listed in my written testimony. We are all in support of the sports bill sponsored by Council Member Rodriguez to initiate an Office of Sports and Recreation. At Row New York, we recently uh, asked our young people, what does the organization and the sport of rowing do for you? 
uh, we were really interested in this in this question um, because we had some ideas as adults, but we really wanted to hear from the young people. Uh, and I just want to share with you what they told us. They told us that rowing helps them with their teamwork and their social skills. They told us that rowing helps build their, their physical and mental strength. They told us it helps them build respect for others and form community. And they told us it helps them persevere and show commitment and tenacity. And it helps them understand themselves and what they're capable of. And these were the words of our young people. And I believe, as I know my 10 other colleagues believe that these benefits of sports are incredibly powerful and that they are life-changing and should be accessible to all the young people in New York City. Uh, but we know the reality is that sports in New York City are not accessible to all young people. There's increasing privatization of youth sports and pay to play fees that are required by many entities have contributed to disparities that define youth sports in New York City. I don't have any stats on New York City um, in specifically, but I do know there's been a national study by the Aspen Institute about this issue. And that shows that about 70% of students from families earning over $100,000 play sports, but only 30% of students from families that earn under $25,000 are playing sports. So there's just a tremendous disparity. Uh, and we believe this disparity is, is unacceptable and that the sports bill can help make quality sports-based youth development accessible for more of New York City's youth. Thank you very much for including our testimony. Thank you very much. Council Member Rodriguez has a question. Rachel, I know that you took over again the responsibility of Amanda and I know that you would do the same or even a better job. That's what we should expect. I want my children to do better than me. Mm -hmm. and, and I know as having now Amanda, you know, at the, and, and, you know, moving at the national level, that also, this is something that also we should, you know, you should share you after, you know, as incorporating the question because we have partners, not only at the city level, we have partners at the state, national, international level. And we were here from Ken when it came when it came when it came to cyclist soup. So in a can in a Kenzo a, a rowing, as I'm not gonna repeat what I said before about being Dominicans, probably I'm one of the few Dominicans that is not much into baseball, but people think about Dominican Ale Rodriguez, Manny, whatever, uh, Pedro Martinez. So for me, it's about rowing was new. How how can you explain also about at the level of rowing, especially because what opened my heart for me, and I only, I can say, I can share sometimes I'm biased because when I say people coming with new program, for me, this is about here you come in and, and usually and very often also it's part of gentrification, but when it can or row in New York, my first question to Amanda was, how will you diversify? And this is a competitive one. You know, my wife is all about the kids who enjoy the sport. And the second part is thinking about a scholarship. So as we're thinking about a scholarship, how you been able to connect rowing with a pre-college program? Because what I heard that you your effort is about to make it competitive through rowing, but also to take them through college and to prepare them also to go for a scholarship. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'll just talk, talk briefly to a couple of things. One, uh, Council Member Rodriguez is uh, making mention of Amanda Carras, our, our former founder and CEO, and she's now the head of uh, US Rowing, the whole governing body for the sport, uh, and is really helping us in terms of diversifying the sport at the next level with, with different kinds of opportunities and resources. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really exciting for us uh, to have that connection. And I think um, in general, we, you know, we're very focused on the sports develop, sports youth development, um, kind of ideas that I mentioned in my testimony. And we have many, many students who are interested in rowing at the next level. And we try to make sure that they're connected to scholarship opportunities. And I would say between 10 and 20% of our students are rowing in college. And many of them feel that they're rowing in college. Uh, many cases, they're attending predominantly white institutions. And then many of the elite institutions in this country have rowing teams. And in many cases, they're saying that their participation on a rowing team in college is really helping them stay in college because they have a, a community of rowers that, that can support them through college, so on their rowing team. So a good, a good portion of our students are interested in that. 
Um, and I would say for all of our students, we use the sport of rowing to help support them through high school and through college, whether they're gonna row at a competitive level or not. So we wanna make sure that, that we're providing the opportunities for students who wanna row competitively. But if there's some students don't want to keep rowing, it's a very grueling sport. Um, it's very physical, physically grueling. Not every student wants to continue rowing in college. And for those students who don't, we want to make sure that all the skills that they have learned in our program are transferable to the academic skills and the, and the social skills that they'll need in college as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Phil, Con Phil Konigsberg, who will be followed by Ken Podziba. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for holding this meeting, this hearing. Um, my name is Phil Konigsberg. I'm the uh, chair of Queens Community Board 7, the health chair, excuse me, not the chair, uh, health chair of Community Board 7, but I'm speaking here for myself only. Um, and I just first want to say that I'm in favor of the both pieces of legislation. However, I, the rest of my testimony, I, I'd like to basically, it's really coming out of left field. And what I'm saying is it's regarding a specific park. It's Flushing Meadows Corona Park. And within Flushing Cor Corona Park, specifically City Field. Um, it's almost two years that I've been trying to resolve an issue that goes on at City Field, both the previous ownership and at this point, I don't see any changes with Steve Cohen. Hopefully that'll change. Let me be as brief as I can on this. Um, City Field allows three designated smoking areas within the stadium. Now, the New York City Smoke-Free Air Act prohibits any smoking within New York City parkland. City Field is within Flushing Meadows Corona Park, as I said. I have brought this issue up, as I said, for almost two years now. Uh, as far as I know, it's gotten to the Parks Council, uh, Alessandro Olivieri's office. Uh, I was told 16 months ago that this issue would be cleared up by the beginning of the next, uh, the opening of the baseball season. Well, obviously that was really a moot point in 2020, but we're approaching hopefully the start of fans in the stands for the 21st, uh, for this current year. I've written to every member of the parks uh, committee. I've not gotten a response. I was hoping that uh, uh, council member Mark Levine might uh, still be here uh, to input something as far as a health issue. And I've also spoken, after I got on uh, Brian Lehrer's radio talk show, I spoke with the mayor and I got a call from Matt Trury. Um, see, he's no longer on the uh, participation here. I would like to get an answer to please remove the three designated areas within City Field, because I believe it's part of the New York City Smoke Free Air, and I've never gotten any response yet. And I think I just hit my three minute mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, next up is uh, Ken Podziba, followed by Daniel Cole. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairman Ku, distinguished members of the City Council, and everyone I see on Zoom. I see a lot of familiar faces. My name is Ken Podziba, and I'm the President and CEO of Bike New York. I'm here to enthusiastically support the establishment of an Office of Sports Development and Youth Performance. Prior to arriving at Bike New York, I served as the commissioner of the New York City Sports Commission for 12 years, and I believe that it will be tremendously beneficial to New Yorkers to bring back a form of this office as proposed in intro 1951-2020. The Sports Commission, under my leadership, served as an important engine for the city's economic growth through sports. We competed with other cities throughout the country and around the world for the right to bring major sporting events to New York. 
We also marketed the city to event organizers as an ideal place for them to host their athletic events. And we assisted them throughout the entire process, including guiding them through the city's bureaucracy, something that they simply wouldn't be able to do without us. The agency served as the city's liaison to this multi-billion dollar industry, including our teams and major annual events that was estimated to account for two and a half percent of the city's total um, annual economy. Beyond the economics, the Sports Commission had a big heart and focused most of its time and resources on transforming the lives of the city's most underserved communities. After having numerous conversations with City Council member Adonis Rodriguez, sponsor of the bill, and knowing how he's dedicated so much of his life toward improving the lives of our city's most economically disadvantaged people, I'm convinced that this office will be fully dedicated towards helping New Yorkers, especially our young people, and those from the most vulnerable populations lead healthier and more productive lives. There are countless nonprofits that provide needed recreation and sports programs to New Yorkers, but unfortunately, not everyone knows about them or how to access their services. Wouldn't it be great to have a mayoral office that can create awareness of these programs? For example, the Sports Commission offers a variety of bike education and safety skill programs, including summer camp and after school programs, all free of charge to underserved children. I'm on the board of the Achilles Track Club, a nonprofit organization that transforms the lives of people with disabilities through athletic programs and social connection. Having an influential office of the mayor encouraging New Yorkers to participate and benefit from the vast array of programs that already exist in our great city would be priceless. And there are so many small group grassroots organizations and recreational organizations that can and should be doing more to help the residents in their neighborhoods. They just need a little help and some technical assistance. And this office can be a source of support to them and a real force for positive changes. More than half the city's population is overweight or obese and nearly half of all elementary school students and Head Start students do not have a healthy weight. I'm confident that a newly off this newly office would- I have well expired. Is that time? Uh, please finish, you, you may wrap up, please. Okay, I believe that a newly office, a newly created office of sports and recreation would help level the playing field in our city and put so many New Yorkers on a better path to good health and success. Thank you for your consideration. And I'll take anyone's questions if you have it. Thank you, Council Member Rodriguez does have questions. First of all, I know that this is something that since I heard the word from the chairman at the beginning, and also uh, uh, we both agree, uh, Chairman Cook, that in China, in many other countries, they have, you know, a, a robust plan on how to put the pipeline uh, uh, to take it uh, to create, you know, the opportunity. And, and this is about competitive. Uh, as I say, a lot of things happen in the recreation and we support it. And, and, and I think even the other piece of this legislation and the other part of this conversation about permits is something that is important in our city. But uh, Ken, do you think that there's a, and of course, as I said before, can cyclists is a sport? And, 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 and I think that when we look at France and other places, a, a country in the world, like this, this is like a 365 days of investing in, 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 in cycling competition. So, um, and, and of course, Bike New York, and I'm a big champion uh, 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 because I feel that the work that you guys is doing with the five world tour that hopefully will happen now also in August. Everyone should know, this is the largest tour that we have in the nation. And, Chairman could by adding two or three more hours and can, can talk, for them to add an additional number of cyclists, they can train this bike tour as the larger one in New York City. Can you look, can you think about two things, two questions to you. One is, how do you think that we still can support more uh, the competition of, of a bike a tour or cycling competition in New York City, where do you see that we are still short and we can do more? And how can this office be up to that, accomplish a goal? And 
Second, because I believe that we have a good topography. We have a good, you know, from Jersey to New York and other places. I think that we have the opportunity to continue expanding a, a, a competitive competition in, in the city when it comes to cyclists. And the second piece is about, do you think that there's an appetite in the foundations and the private sector from all the sport institutions, as I say, Madison Square Garden, Barclay, Yankee Stadium, uh, the Met, and, and others to also, if we are able to put this office together to also increase the contribution. Because guys, when we have this conversation, it's very easy to make the number. You know, any institution can say, we support that because we give three, this number of tickets every year. It's not about tickets. It's about putting resources to promote and provide support to our youth. So can you elaborate a little bit on those two things? Yeah, absolutely. The, fir the first part of your question, I wish we had an office of sports right now being at Bike New York. We have a lot of issues with the city and you've been very helpful, um, council member Rodriguez and so, so other council members. Um, but it's really been very challenging dealing with the city's bureaucracy and how great would it be if we had an office that helped us navigate through that bureaucracy. Sometimes you don't know who to talk to and then you passed on to someone else and then someone else. So I think not just Bike New York, but so many organizations out there could benefit from an office of sports and recreation. Um, you know, it's kind of weird that we don't have one. Every major city around the world has an, a sports office. So I just don't understand why New York doesn't have one. So I'm glad it's coming back. Um, to answer your second question, absolutely. I think the teams, the leagues, the event organizers, everyone would support this office in so many ways. Um, my testimony was shortened, but I wanted to tell everybody that the, um, the most, one of the most impactful programs we had at the Sports Commission was also the easiest to run. It was called Mayor's Take Me Out to the Ball Game Program. And all the teams, leagues, event organizers gave us free tickets. They donated their tickets when they didn't sell out. And we in turn gave it to organizations that served the, the poorest and most underserved kids in the city. And we got the most heartwarming letters from kids saying they've never been out of their neighborhoods or boroughs before, how great it was to meet their heroes. We arranged autographs. So my point is there's so much, this little office could do so much and leverage the, the office of the mayor and all the city agencies to do so much. We had a, a citywide mayor's cup events. So we had all these athletic competitions among high schools and middle schools. There's so much this office could do. And with good leadership, I have no doubt it's going to just be a bang up organization. I delivered hundreds of mayoral proclamations. A good leader will be a cheerleader for New York City going around to communities and letting them know the mayor's office and the city cares about you. We care about your event. There's a million reasons to have this office. So I thank you for doing your best to restore it. And I, I hope um, the powers that be give it the consideration it deserves and votes yes, because we need it. And all the people here um, could do so much more, I think, with a, with a good office to support what they need and could really serve as a, a, a way of making awareness. So many, there's so many great programs, but people don't necessarily know about them. An, a, an office of the mayor could really help, you know, go to schools, talk to teachers, talk to the powers that be and get people moving through, through our programs. Thank you, Ken. I would like to acknowledge, as I said, that you have been very important since, since you also uh, represent the continuation of the major office of sport that we have, the Bloomberg, and again, and Sing and the rest of the team. And I got to, I got to recognize also that the public advocate, Jomani William, and the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Aden, someone that has been also a voice to uh, advocate for sports in our community, but especially in this, uh, the effort, the ideas for this office is something that we have a close conversation and so on again that support this bill. Thank you. And I will do everything in my power to help this office succeed along with you and everyone on this call. So thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Daniel uh, Pohl followed by uh, Wendy Hilliard. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Daniel Pohl. I'm a volunteer coach with the West Side Little League. Uh, returning to the issues around field permits, 
The Parks Department is preventing organized and safe youth sports when it fails to issue permits or revokes permits and instead institutes that first come first serve field access. That's because organized sports leagues like our Little League can't play without permits because we have liability insurance policies that require permitted or reserved fields. Our league's insurance don't cover play on pickup or first serve, uh, first come first serve fields. So not only do organizations have liability insurance, we have rule books, safety officers, umpires, participating adults like myself, a volunteer coach, have completed CPR and AED training and background checks. Little League coaches carry those automated external defibrillators to AED devices to every game. All those safety protections go away when the Parks Department fails to issue permits or revokes permits. And these organizations with the safety protocols and insurance can't play. Second, the Parks Department field and permit closures are harming kids' mental and physical health and removing options for safe outdoor play. Does the Parks Department realize how badly these program cancellations and permit cancellations are affecting kids' physical and mental health? I'm shocked at the poor physical and mental condition that many of our kids are in. A lot of the kids that I've known over the years have gained weight and seem mentally off coming out of COVID. These kids really need the sports leagues to stay physically and mentally healthy. Regarding the COVID spread, the safest place for kids to play is outside. The Parks Department is effectively pushing kids indoors where COVID spreads easier when they reduce the options to play outdoors in the organized sports leagues. The Parks Department and City Hall must provide transparency about why these services are closed and exactly what triggers them to reopen. City Hall and the Parks Department needs to be transparent about when things will reopen. We New Yorkers understand the need for social distancing, but we'd be so much more hopeful about the future if we heard specifics about when things can open. The vague closed until further notice messages coming from the Parks Department or we're waiting to hear from the Department of Health it just makes things so much more depressing. And that's even what I'm hearing today when we were discussing the contact sports earlier. We deserve specific reasoning about why a service is closed and specific criteria oh. about what we do. May I finish? Please do. We deserve specific criteria about when uh, programs and field permits can reopen. It's not good enough just to say close to prevent the spread of COVID. There should be a mandate to reasonably explain based on science why any closure actually does more good than harm. And last, the Parks Department is missing the opportunity to be a hero in this pandemic. Even after the CDC recommended outdoor activities over indoor, the city has shut down or threatened to shut down playgrounds, dog runs, tennis courts, golf courses, beaches, and just last weekend, the Central Park hockey rinks. Why does the Parks Department seem to be seeking ways to shut down safe outdoor activities instead of promoting them? Going forwards, please look for ways to support organized sports leagues, like our Little League, instead of making arbitrary and seemingly punitive rules that do little to prevent the spread of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Wendy Hilliard, who will be followed by Jordan Baltimore. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. I want to thank Representative Rodriguez and Nzinga Prescott for their efforts to bring this critical issue to life. Now, I took gymnastics at a training center, at a recreation center. My coaches, Russian coaches, were hired by the city of Detroit. We practiced in our local recreation centers and it cost me about $20 a year to take gymnastics. I was the first black to represent the US in international competition. My teammate went to two Olympic games. 
I came to New York City to finish school, but I also became president of the Women's Sports Foundation, coached my athlete to the Olympic Games, and performed on Broadway. 25 years ago, I started my foundation, which has provided almost 20, 25,000 youth with free and low-cost gymnastics, the only one like it in the city, and very few in the country. Note that there is no, not one public gymnastic center in New York City. There was one, it went to the peers probably 20 years ago, but there's not one public gymnastic center in New York City when the most famous gymnast in the world is the best athlete and she's an athlete of color, she's a gymnast of color. I think we can do better in New York. I also wanna say I'm not here just for gymnastics, but I'm here for all sports primarily non-traditional sports and sports for girls and youth with disabilities. I was director of the New York City Olympic and Paralympic bid for the Olympic Games, worked very closely with Ken Patsiba. We had to design a plan that would leave a legacy for Olympic and Paralympic sports. So I can assure you that New York City has the sports, has the coaches, the experts, the facilities, and millions of youth who want and need sport competition right here in their city. We have the infrastructure to make this work. This investment will circle back to ensure that these young people will learn the critical educational fundamentals, physical education fundamentals that will make them healthy adults and raise healthy children. We know what needs to be done. Bringing all of this together is what we can do. You see, our young people have been online and inside for the past year. Let's do this and make it work. You know, um, we talked about the Peter Westbrook Foundation and having someone up come through your ranks. And I have my coach, Alexis Page from Harlem, started with us at seven years old, made the national team, competed around the world for four years, and is now coaching again. So this will all work, and we really have to do it, and we can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And council member Rodriguez has a question. It's more reinforcing uh, Wendy about the importance of the work. Of course, I'm gonna be checking on you because my little one is doing gymnastics. So <laughs> it's not a council member, it's a father. So, uh, uh, and, and, and all I say is about when anyone say, no everyone is a college material, I say my daughters are. And in that the petition that I have for my daughter, then that's the expectation that I have for every single kid. So if we, if I believe that my daughter can be great on whatever they choose, then I believe that every single children also should have those talents. So where, in which particular area do you think that we need to focus the most when it came to connecting kids who live in this abundance community and guy, that's not happening in Africa, Latin America, or Asia. That's happening here in our background, okay? Oh, yeah. A few miles away from wherever we live, there's a group of kids that they have all the talented to be competitive in the same field that a kid lives with that is mainly who living in an upper-class community. Mm -hmm. So where, when did you see that we have to tackle it the most? in order to connect more youth to competitive sport feel that our youth need in New York City? Well, thank you for the question. I think you have to focus more. You can do this in each borough, but you already have all these organizations that do specialized sports. We need a place to do it, and it has to be coordinated. I think you also really have to focus on the girls. I heard a lot about the permitting, and the one question I would ask is how many of these permits go to girls groups? I mean, you really have to make sure that when you do things for girls and youth for disability, you have to make access. You have to go extra. It's not about how many people want to do it. You have to make sure that their um, the situation is good for girls, that they can come and they need indoor space. Not everybody's going to be out of the basketball court. So I think the first thing we should focus on is find who's doing sports and connect them with the, a space where they can do it and we can all work together. The one thing is all of us coaches, all the people that do the sports that grew up in it, we know how to do it. 
We just need to coordinate with a site that's safe for kids to go to, and that's what this office can do, and then we can make it work from that point. But we can do this, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next up is Jordan Baltimore, followed by Rita Finkel. Time starts now. Good afternoon. I'm Jordan Baltimore from New York Empire Baseball. Uh, I want to thank the City Council uh, and Chairman Koo for uh, hosting this this, uh, this testimony, this hearing. Uh, I want to thank the opportunity to uh, to testify as well. Um, I want to point out on the permitting process. Um, our experience, and we've been doing this for about 11 years, and the last three years have definitely demonstrated improvement uh, across a number of aspects of the process. Uh, one of them, and maybe the most important, is communication. Um, in the last three years, undoubtedly, compared to the eight years prior, the response time, the permit publication dates, the communications, uh, and even the inspection process has improved. And I know that we're, we're more likely to hear about the complaints in the process. I wanted to point out that there's undoubtedly been improvement along those lines. Certainly, it can continue to get better. Um, I can also tell you that during the COVID, uh, you know, during the COVID permitting in the fall, our organization was inspected eight straight days on baseball fields. I'm happy to report that we passed all eight straight days, but that's not the point. Eight straight days of being inspected says to me that there is a tremendous focus from the Parks Department and the resources are being utilized well. And maybe to everyone's point earlier, they do need more resources, but that might not solve it because we'll never have enough resources. I can't imagine that there's enough funding in the entire city to have enough PEP officers to really patrol all of this. And do we really want to spend those resources patrolling what may be a somewhat broken permitting process. We'd rather spend those resources on, on field maintenance, wouldn't we? Because that will open up fields and more fields and more access. And that brings me to some of the challenges that we've continued to experience. Um, even though the permitting date and publication date has gotten better, it's still not early enough. So there's still difficulty in planning that I'm sure many of my colleagues in, in other sports, not just baseball have shared. Um, and there is still a, a, a persistence of some large organizations that continue to apply for and not use permits. And they're being grandfathered over and over and over again. And again, do we really wanna spend, I understand we may have to, but do we really wanna spend very, very challenged resources patrolling people who aren't doing the right thing and who otherwise say that they're here for the children when in reality they're not. So I wonder if there are meaningful conversations to be had around the cost of permits and if that's a deterrent to smaller and nonprofit organizations like ours, then maybe there are some public private partnerships, a community outreach person, and even reduced fees or waived fees for organizations that qualify and need those reductions. And maybe there are significant fines for non usage. Um, I realize my time is up, but I do want to say one more thing. Um, time has expired. For Councilman Rod Member Rodriguez. Um, I can only say this uh, about the bill that's in that's been proposed. It makes me extremely optimistic about the future of youth sports in this city. Um, before being a part of New York Empire Baseball, I was a PSAL baseball coach, and I've followed children from four years old all the way up through college, even to the Cincinnati Reds organization. And all I can tell you is that what you've proposed will have a tremendous effect not just for the children who go on to play at a very high level, but even for the ones who don't go on to play at a very high level, because the focus that you will provide for every child that participates in youth sports in this city will be extraordinary for everything they do in their life. So thank you. And anything that we can do and that I can do personally and professionally to be a part of that, um, count me in. Thank you. Thank you. And Council, Council Member Rodriguez does have a, a question. Yeah, yes, to say thank you, Jordan. And definitely we will follow with you. And I agree 100% with what you said. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rita Finkel, followed by Peter Westbrook. Time starts now.
Rita, I think you're on mute. Sprinkle, could you just pause for a second? Yes, while we unmute you. Um, yes, and please, you can restart. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman Ku, and thank you to Councilmember Rodriguez for the invitation to address you today. My name is Rita Finkel, and I am the co-president of the Armory Foundation. I am here today to advocate for the establishment of an Office of Sports and Recreation. During my 22 years of working with young athletes, first as the executive director of the Fencers Club, where I got the pure joy of meeting Nzinga Prescott, and Peter Westbrook, and Wendy Hilliard, and Ken Patsiva. Um, and for the past 15 years at the Armory Foundation, I've witnessed the tremendous impact sports can have on building the human spirit. To some, the Armory in Washington Heights is the home of the National Track and Field Hall of Fame and the fastest track in the world. To others, the Armory is where magic can happen and often does, both on and off the track. Our mission is keeping kids on track. What follows is a glimpse of what happens at the Armory in a non-COVID year. Thousands of New York City high school track athletes call the Armory home for both training and competition. For decades, on Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons from mid-November through the end of March, we've welcomed up to 1,500 athletes to train with their coaches from over 80 New York City public, independent, and parochial schools. More than 100 track meets happened during these months. Five years ago, we piloted Little Feet, a program for hundreds of third through fifth grade community children to run, jump, throw, and giggle twice a week from October through the middle of May. Through the years, we have expanded and now include children in grades two. They are our tiny feet. In addition to Little Feet and Tiny Feet, we have City Track offered at the Armory, imparting the joy of moving and promoting healthy habits for children in grades six through eight. So you do not get the idea that all we do is fun and games. We also work with our track and field athletes to get, help them gain access to great high schools and four-year colleges with the funding to make a college degree a reality. Armory College Prep is a dynamic after-school college success program that puts students in grades five through 12 on track for lifelong success by helping them to and through college, ongoing despite the pandemic. For the last four years, 100% of our seniors have been admitted to four-year colleges. In the 80s, the Armory was a homeless shelter. Today, the Armory is a representation of a public-private partnership that has had the great privilege to be part of the development of many of the world's top track and field athletes. Despite COVID, we firmly believe in the ability of sports to continue to connect and teach young people lifelong lessons of discipline, determination, and dedication, all while having fun, building friendships, and maintaining fitness. We would like to stress to the council that our track I'm record, tired. I'm just wrapping up, of excellent high impact programming has allowed us to reach thousands of young New Yorkers. We offer the above only as a starting point for the type of work that could be supported and developed and brought much further by an office of sports and recreation for all New Yorkers as we reimagine New York City post COVID. Thank you very much and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And Council Member Rodriguez has a question. Well, I think that, you know, it's, it's difficult to have this conversation about the potential of the armory without remember, not remembering uh, Dr. Sander, uh, uh, someone also that I know uh, have important influence on Rita and the rest of the leadership of the armory. So for me, like, you know, one thing, again, with my great here, 55, my 11 year, my last year at the council right now that I'm trying to see is that how do we create permanent a working relationship, you know, and create network. And I think that that's what we have seen today. It's a key citywide institution so connected with, with so many people, with so many resources. And I know that the architect who built, let's say, the headquarters of Apple, is the one who is designing the new facility for Ronnie York in England. And so there's the, that's the, the, the type of board members that all of you has in all of your institution. And, and, and Rita, and two things with that is about how do you see also that the partners that you have at the Armory, 
from New Balance to other, the many sponsor could be interested to also engage in conversation to see how they can, uh, uh, again, be part of helping uh, uh, this office. And the second piece, as you say, is about thinking about after COVID. Uh, when we think about uh, athletic, athletic and sport and thinking about supporting a young person to compete, it's not only about the discipline that he or she is, it's about everything that is a run on what is needed. And that's why I, you know, the, the way of how I started connecting with the Brooklyn Board President, Eric Adams, on this was about the nutrition uh, effort that he's making. And how do you think that the Armory being working so close with Columbia Medical School, Columbia University, in New York, a private studio and also, can add a piece or engaging them to be part of this. So that we, if you think about the mayor's office of a sports and recreation, we also think about nutrition. You're thinking about also training and providing the, those youth in disadvantaged community that they don't have, the family they don't make enough to go in and buy organic. You know, how do you see that piece related to health? And, and how do you think that the partnership that you already have with uh, the private sector and the medical school, the hospital can also be involved in this effort? Thank you, um, Councilmember Rodriguez, for both those questions. I think that um, with, with our sponsors, the key is have a very well laid out plan. And I think this, this group is thinking about a very well laid out plan. This is not going to be haphazard. Um, I think there is a, it, right this moment, there is a desire for corporate America to step up and do something and do something that's meaningful and big and not just kind of passing papers around. And I think that your idea here is, is so, so rich um, I, I would say, I don't think you're going to have trouble connecting with sponsors. And I also think that my neighbors, where we sit in Washington Heights, um, Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital, they are wonderful partners. They are wonderful partners. They help us on so many levels. And I think they would be, I don't want to speak for them, but decision makers, at the table are gonna think this idea is, is terrific. It's terrific. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter Westbrook, followed by Jenny Veloz. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Time starts now. Okay, let me speak fast because I definitely do not want to get the hook. First of all, my name is Peter Westbrook. Not to boast, I'm a six-time Olympian, bronze medalist in the Olympic sport of fencing, and I am the president of the Peter Westbrook Foundation. I just want to thank each and every one of you, this committee, the Park Creations, Parks and Recreation Committee for the amazing job that what you are doing. Council Member Rodriguez, I want to thank you. I like your passion, but I didn't know that this was your initiative. So as they say in our sport, you the man, brother. Let me proceed. This, this is for the fencing. Let me just say this. I created this foundation 30 years ago. And the reason I created this sports, I grew up in the housing projects of Newark, New Jersey. And I would have fell through the cracks like 90% of the kids that I grew up with. Thousands of them fell through the cracks. So this sport saved my life. Forget the Olympic Games. Elevated my whole life to a new way of thinking and existing. That's why we started the foundation. That's why I give back. No matter what I do, I can't give back enough. So we create Olympians, world champion medalists, national champion. We'll have Olympians going to this Olympic Games in Tokyo, a bunch of them. But more important than Olympians, let me say, guys, what you do, and I'm so proud of each and every one of you. We have 100% high school graduation rate. 98% of our kids move on to colleges, not only state colleges, Harvard, Yale, MIT, NYU, University of Penn. We have about 150 to 180 kids in our program. Forget about becoming Olympians. What we do is this, like all of you, 
we elevate the children to overcome all obstacles, to be the best that they can be, to achieve greatness. So I appreciate creating Olympians, but more so I appreciate what we are doing, which is creating Olympians in life. So I want to thank you, Council Member Rodriguez. I am in favor of your bill. And as I close, I would say, as my kids say, Council Member, forgive me, but you the man. Thank you, Councilmember Rodriguez. Well, Peter, thank you. I know about, you know, uh, as a recent immigrant myself, again, I came here at the age of 18 to wash dishes. And, and a lot of people have, especially my other sister, a lot to do for me to be here today. And I, and, and, and I all about, you know, we are the continuation. I'm here because I took classes with Professor Jeffrey. Uh, I went to lecture with Lumber Brown. And, and for me, you know, I do believe that it is important to think about the present, but most important, the future generation. And one thing that all of us has learned, changes take longer than what we thought when we were high school students. And, 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 and that's my approach. And, and again, this is not only my idea, this is also the idea of Rulkinborough President Eric Adam, with whom I had discussed this idea with whom we plan together and we incorporate the peace related to nutrition and the need also to create better condition for our youth to eat healthy in order for them to do better when they practice any sport. And also I would like to, you know, uh, thank uh, the office of Major de Blasio also for being open. I've been engaging in conversation with the legislative team of his office and they're open and we will be engaging engaging conversation and the team who are here today, you know, be ready because we will have a next meeting, Zoom meeting with City Hall, with, with, with our speaker, Corey Johnson, who also I had to stand hand and, and J Jason Goldman also, because both of them being, they being a supporter. So when the administration is open, positive, when you have a partner such as the Brooklyn Board President Eric Adam, when you have the city hall and the speaker saying, we want to work with you. And then we have all of you guys. There's no one way of how we cannot make it. So we will. So Peter, it, one piece to you is about what, what are there in the city of New York when it comes to, you know, relationship with, with national and international institution that also we can connect some a relationship for them also to be engaged in whatever we can plan at the city level. Just what we're doing right now, connecting with great leaders like Wendy, like Rita, like Ken, and my little Zingy, the Zinga, just what we're doing right now, connecting with these leaders, getting them in the room together, and great things will happen. It doesn't make a difference what sports. You get us together in a room, a uh, council member, and great things will come out of this. We will do great things together. I want to say I'm so proud of my little uh, girl, Nazinga. She's amazing. She's Olympian, world champion, and now she's an Olympian in life. She came to me when she was nine years old. Now she's uh, whatever age she is now, but Nazinga, you're amazing, and thank you for inviting me to this. I'm so proud of you. Thank you, uh, council member. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, our next speaker is uh, uh, Jenny Villas, uh, followed by Adam Fraser. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jenny Villas. I'm a community organizer and New York lawyers for the public interest, and I'm here on behalf of the Fair Play Coalition. The Fair Play Coalition is a coalition of students, teachers, coaches, principals, parents, activists, and advocate, advocates standing together for all high school students in New York City. In New York City public schools have equitable access to the PSAL and to all athletic fields and courts controlled by the DOE. For the last four plus years, Fair Play has advocated for equity and publicly funded after school sports for public school students. We have engaged in legislative advocacy and successfully passed a bill in this council requiring the Department of Education to make public how it allocates its resources among students when funding after school sports. We've engaged in outreach and community organizing. And we have sued the DOE to try to require it to fix the discriminatory manner in which it allocates after school sports teams throughout the city. Why have we focused our energy on the DOE? It's because a primary agency already exists that provides publicly funded sports and recreation opportunities to students across the city. 
and it is operated within the DOE, the Public School Athletic League. The PSAL is well established and has historically borne the responsibility of providing sports and recreation opportunities for students across the city. And while we continue to advocate to fix the PSAL's inequitable policies, we do not believe that creating an entirely new, separate, ambiguous office with a similar mission is the correct move, particularly in these times of fiscal restraint. While we appreciate the concept of creating an office of sports and recreation, we are concerned that this entity will shift the focus from the more pressing issue at hand, ensuring we work to bring back already existing after school sports in an equitable manner. In short, 1959 stated goal that this new office will work to provide access to sports related opportunities for students and promote the role of sports and education and recreation is duplicative. Since the PSAL provides the same service to public high school students, albeit in an inequitable way. We believe that instead of creating a new office, the city and council's priority should be fixing the PSAL system. The Fair Play Coalition continues to advocate on behalf of Black and Latinx students who, especially now with the suspension of sports due to COVID-19, have, no, have had to endure almost a year with no sports. Instead of what seems to be an almost redundant service, we should be focusing on solutions to improve the PSAL system and ensure equal access to all high school students in New York City. It has been almost a year since after school sports were suspended due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mayor de Blasio recently spoke about bringing back after school sports, prioritizing health and safety, but did not mention equity. For years, PSAL has denied access to sports to Black and Latinx students while providing more resources to larger, more integrated schools. The mayor and PSAL have the opportunity now to implement a plan for a safe return to sports while also ensuring that resources are distributed equitably. However, access to sports goes beyond athletics, and there is also an inequality regarding school athletic facilities. Schools like the equipment- Time expired. I'm almost done. Um, and there is also an inequality regarding school athletic facilities. Schools lack the equipment, practice facilities, and other resources to field a proper team. If intro 1959 were to move forward, we would consider supporting an amended bill focused on coordination of access to parks, park permits, and facilities to ensure equity. All schools, large and small, should be able to field a team or conduct practices utilizing proper facilities. We look forward to continuing our advocacy with the council, the administration, and our students' strong voices. Once again, thank you for your time. Thank you. And Councilmember Rodriguez has a remark. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I appreciate your, your level of advocacy and, and commitment and letting you know that I'm more than happy to follow a conversation with you because we don't look to take away any role that any from non-for-profit to private to a, a PSLA. As I say, I've been a co-founder to a school before being elected after graduating in 93. I was a co-founder of Gregorio Luperon High School, which won two years ago the baseball high school a championship in, in playing the Yankee Stadium. And we had a great sport program in volleyball and other field has also been the co-founder of the Washington Heights Health Academy. So I do agree with you that especially the schools that are mainly uh, what I call the school or the working class mm -hmm. and need to get more attention and need to get more resources. And the ideas of the office, again, is to establish level of collaboration and as an office that can work together and, and trying to centralize what I feel is things that is happening through DOE Mm -hmm. through the Department of Park and DYCD. So more than happy to continue conversation with you to see how we can again join forces together. Thank and, you. And we're happy to meet with your office to continue this discussion. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adam Frazier, who will be followed by Anthony Rivera. Time starts now. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to testify about the Office of Sport and Recreation. I'm Adam Fraser, Chief Executive of the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation. We are a grant-making, capacity-building, and coalition-enabling organization founded under the patronage of Nelson Mandela after the role he saw sport play in rebuilding post-apartheid South Africa. We've raised almost $200 million for the global sports-based youth development sector um, over the past 20 years and impacted the lives of 6 million young people. In New York City, we've given more than a million dollars in grants over the past four years, 
and built Sport for Good NYC, which is a coalition of more than 60 local organizations using sport for social change and also providing testimony for this hearing. Um, as you might expect of an organization founded under the patronage of President Mandela, we believe in the powerful relationship between sport and government. And with funding from the likes of Mercedes-Benz, the Richmond Group, Nike, and many others, we believe in the power of public-private partnership, and we believe in the outcomes of sports-based youth development. We have proof points for that all around the world. In the Netherlands, we have a nationwide partnership with the Dutch government using sport to prevent youth incarceration and recidivism. In the UK, where I grew up, the mayor's office partnered with Nike and Laureus to directly support our coalitions and grantees with a focus on social integration. As an immigrant to the US and a resident of New York, I can speak personally about the role sport played in my own journey and the relationships that allowed me to build in this city. Uh, but as we've heard, not everyone has that same level of access, which is critical for so many reasons. So our, our belief in this office is a belief in opportunity. The city has untapped partnerships with professional teams, leagues, businesses, and our experience has shown what can be unlocked when those groups engage with youth sports programs to unleash the power of sport to drive social change, build bridges and transcend racial and economic barriers. All of those things are crucial when the current system can be one of pay-to-play dominance, creating inequitable access to sport and play. This office can provide oversight and support to change that landscape and provide streamlined possibilities for youth sports-based development programs to tap into strategic initiatives out of the mayor's office. Youth sports organizations throughout the city and country have been waiting for government to recognize the untapped potential of sport to tackle social issues, including violence, discrimination, and inequality, the other key focus areas we work to, to end. We believe this office can provide a centralized support and oversight needed to provide every young person with an opportunity to access a high quality youth development centered sport experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, our next speaker is Anthony Rivera, who will be followed by Carlos Velasquez, who is the last registered speaker for the hearing. Time starts now. Thank you, everyone. My name is Tony Rivera. I'm the president of the Lower East Side OLS Little League. We are an organization that's been around for 60 years, servicing mostly people of color. Our organization is, is mostly recreational, but we also appreciate what the council member is, is doing with this new proposal. We also have a very competitive uh, portion to our, our program. And in the past, we've had uh, the luxury of having someone like Dylan Betanza start his Little League career with us, you know, the, the all-star Yankee pitcher and now with the Mets. We've also uh, had the benefit of producing several players that have gone on to get full scholarships in college uh, through, through, through baseball. Uh, and, and they've gone through very diverse colleges, some, some of them in, in Texas, Oklahoma, and Detroit. So we, you know, our, our, our appreciation for what these kind of programs can do for the youth is, is well understood by us. And, and we've also tried to connect with other countries like Puerto Rico and Santo Domingo, where we've taken a group of kids, a team of 15, 16 year olds, and, flo and flown them over there and play a week or a week and a half of games. And we did that on a shoestring budget with $400 being charged per player. Can you imagine feeding, flying, and, and, and having all of this done for the kids for the price of $400. So an agency like this could really help us out with resources. We think that perhaps having additional resources like a, a sports facility, indoor training facility in the Lower East Side, I think is, is sorely needed, quite frankly. Um, there, are, there are spots where that can be done and you can actually foster this kind of high level competitive uh, student athlete. As far as the, the uh, permit situation, we, we, we also appreciate what the Parks Department is doing in, in terms of you know, pre-COVID uh, procedures and being careful. But I, I also want folks to understand that we're an all volunteer organization like so many other organizations. We're asking these same coaches who are volunteering, not getting paid to go out there train, develop youth, but also we were asking them to, you know, carry around the AEDs, be a, a standby, you know, EMT member if some, some situation develops on the field. Now we're asking them to do temperature checks and, and a whole host of other, other things that we need to manage for them, which, you know, as you can appreciate, no one's getting paid to do this. So parks enforcement, yes, we appreciate, we want that. 
we'd like park enforcement to help us actually enforce it, not to just be there to you know, issue citations or violations. And, and you know, we shouldn't be worried that our permits are gonna be taken away if one person or, or, or passerby is not complying with, with COVID measures. So I, I think what I heard was there would be, you know, not too heavy handed, but I, I think there needs to be some- Time expired. Yeah, I think that, that was it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one, one last thing I'd like to, if, if uh, Council Member Rodriguez, I'd love to make a connection. I, I don't don't have your contact details, but it seems like you're, we're clearly supportive of your of your initiative and we'd love to have a dialogue and, and get engaged on that on that front. And of course, of course, uh, my email is yrodriguez at council.nyc.gov. So if you shoot me a test, I have my wife for here and I will immediately reply and give you my cell phone again, yrodriguez at council.nyc.gov. And that's great also that you can join this effort. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our last registered speaker is Carlos Velasco. Time starts now. Thank you um, to the council for having this uh, meeting and, and allowing me to testify. So uh, my name is Carlos Velasquez. I'm the chief program officer of the Boys Club of New York. For those of you not familiar with the Boys Club of New York, uh, we've been around for 145 years um, serving young men um, in East Harlem, the Lower East Side, um, in Flushing, Queens, and now recently in Brooklyn and in the Bronx. So in terms of the establishment of an office of sports and recreation, I just want to uh, urge everyone to really consider these points, um, which are really impacting the access to uh, sports for young people. One is the equitable, equitable distribution of permits um, to community-based organizations and communities that serve uh, young African-American and Latino and underserved um, students or young people that they're receiving permits, that there is equitable allocation of permits. I think that we've seen more kids in the park. Um, we have a clubhouse on East 111th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue, right across the street from Jefferson um, Park. And two things happen. I either see the park full of young people who are not from East Harlem, or I see the park empty. Um, this fall, we, we were able to conduct full sports leagues, even with uh, COVID going on. We had 200 young people there every Saturday on participating in soccer skills, rugby skills, and a flag football tournament. But I had to navigate the process of how could I have more kids on the field because there was an organization who had permits that didn't use them for the whole time. Um, so thankfully uh, with Deputy Commissioner for Community Partnerships of the NYPD, Chauncey Parker, he was able to give us floodlights so we could illuminate the fields in the evening so we could have more kids on the field. Um, and in terms of access to sports and creating a pipeline, there needs to be an entry point. And we need the way you have an entry point is by creating programs that are uh, recre recreation and maybe less competitive so kids can develop the skills. But right now, the entry point programs come with a price tag of everywhere, anywhere from $100 to $385 that I've seen for these same young people in a community that are having trouble to eat, having trouble with their parents having employment. So I really urge the council to really um, push the parks department and make sure that the leagues and these programs that are coming in are equitable but affordable to the young people in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and just really the establishment around protocols around the field, per, uh, field permits. I put in for Springfield permits as far back as December and I still haven't heard back. I have field permits still um, in question for uh, this spring that I've put in a couple of weeks ago and they're still, I, I still haven't heard back. We can't plan um, uh, appropriate and, and strong programs without really having um, the logistics set up and being able to- uh, give Time me expired. Please go ahead. Please finish. Yeah, and, and the last part is, you know, I'm coming from a place where our programs are $5. We operate, we have uh, current members in the uh, NBA or alums and Major League Baseball. We have swimming pools inside our buildings, um, and that is all for $5 a year. So it, we are a program that provide 
free access, basically free access to sports and free access to resources. We just need to be the ability to have a place to um, have these uh, activities and to make sure that our young people have access in the communities uh, that they live in right now. Thank you very much. Uh, and Council Member Rodriguez does have a question. I, I just want to say thank you also for the work that you're doing. It. And I, we definitely, when it comes to the permit, we also had to address uh, those concerns. But it, I also like to close by from my end, thanking the chairman, the chair of this committee, our friend Peter Cook, for allowing us to also include this bill in this hearing. I know that he's a big supporter of when it comes to a create mechanism to support competitive sport. I also want to thank James Baker and Tirsa Nasser also from the legislative team of, of, the, of, the, of the council. Uh, Jason Goldman also the chief of staff, Corey Johnson and the speaker Johnson also for expressing their support to this bill. As also thanking uh, Jomani William, a public advocate, Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who also we've been partners supporting this initiative, and City Hall that already have expressed that we will be, you know, a, a, they're, say, they're open. And, and most, most important is that we will continue conversation to see how we can build this office together. I also like to thank from my office, my chief of staff, Elizabeth Conforme, and Evelyn Collado, Tomas Garita, and Jose Reyes. They helped me to connect with everyone, all the stakeholders that testified today. So let's get it done. Let's be sure that as we have to close the gap of women and minority in technology, that also we connect those kids in working class community to the same access and resources that they need in order to excel in the, in the sport field. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rodriguez. Uh, at this point, uh, we all persons who have spoken have registered. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify and has not yet spoken, please use the raise hand function and you'll be called on to speak. Seeing none, I will now turn it back to Chairperson Ku to deliver uh, closing remarks and adjourn the hearing. Thank you. So thank you to the New York City Parks Department, uh, the Deputy Commissioner and all the staff, and for everyone who came out to testify today. As we head into the warmer months and folks not to spend more time in the parks, we know that our parks and our athletic fields will be more popular than ever. We also know that the athletic field permit system had challenges prior to COVID and then new ones will come up during the pandemic. And issues will continue after the pandemic. We look forward to continue to work with the parks department and all stakeholders to make this a more equitable and transparent process for all. I also want to say thank you to Council Member Rodriguez, uh, Council Member Rodriguez on his bill. Uh, we will take, uh, work together uh, to make this a success. Thank you again for everyone. And I also want to thank the staff on the Committee on Parks and Recreation, Christopher, Satori, Patrick, uh, Chima, and Monica and my own staff, Elaine and Scott and other ones. Thank you. So the, the, this meeting will be adjourned.